Next, we have our, our on the agenda is the relocation of campus school. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Feho, and then um, you can take it from, from there. Certainly. So I'm thrilled to share the relocation of the campus school to Bethesda right here on Lincoln Avenue. It was a conversation that started uh, before I had my first day here with Ms. Merchant advocating for the students at campus school. Within my first couple of days and a number of time, uh, I was able to visit campus school. I've been in every classroom. And while we made a bunch of course corrections, this is an exciting opportunity for students to come closer to City Hall, to New Rochelle High School. Um, this is exactly what students deserve and I couldn't be happier to go through all of the details of this exciting move uh, on behalf of our students. And so uh, I'm happy to turn it over to both Dr. Marrero and Director Schwach and Mr. Thurnau to take you through all of the details as we get ready for this move. Who uh, wants to share their screen or do you want me to facilitate that? Given that there are three uh, people leading the conversation. I, I think maybe best if you do it and then um, we'll just okay, so cue let me you just when we're gonna go slide to slide. Well, I'll, I'll follow along. So as, as the um, topic on that page runs low, I'll just switch it over. Um, let me just open it up. One moment, I was not expecting to do this. Okay, let me just enlarge. Okay, here we go. I'm assuming people see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Sure, well, good evening. Uh, if I, it's okay, uh, Dr. Fay, who I'll do the introduction of uh, for uh, Director Schwab. Um, I believe uh, it begins in terms of the front line, front ground and uh, boots on the ground leadership is paramount. So I wanna introduce Director Schwab, but also if she can start by giving us the historical perspective of campus, uh, being the person who has been leading the charge, has truly uh, reconstructed in terms of the program and also help in terms of making sure the students' needs are met. This short abbreviated year that I've had, but uh, the work that happened all year long. Uh, Director Schwab, if you can start with an overview of campus and then I'll take it in terms of the excitement that I have about the move to a more centralized location, but also its proximity to our lovely high school. Director Schwab. Shirley, thank you guys so much for having me tonight. Um, for those who are not familiar with the program, it is a program that has been in operation for over 25 years. Um, it did start off slightly differently than it ended up, um, but currently it serves about 80 students per year. Um, and the students that attend our program are students who have struggled to find success at Nourishal High School's main campus for a variety of different reasons. Um, in terms of our student population, about 30% or so um, receive accommodations through IEPs or 504s. That's based on this year's enrollment. Um, we serve a population that is approximately 92% Black and Hispanic and a population that is about 80% um, reduced in free lunch. It is a much smaller program than the high school, um, which is in part why it's so successful. Students receive more individualized attention, um, a more nurturing and supportive environment that allows them, I think, to find the success that they were um, struggling to find at the high school. Um, like their peers at the high school, those students have access to the BOCES in addition to the courses required to graduate. Um, it, past practice has been that core credit deficiencies have been made up via night and summer school. They also have access to the um, extracurricular activities as well as the athletics at the high school available after school. If we can go to the next slide, President Moselli, and thank you, Director Schwab. I want to speak about what we are planning for this upcoming year and the opportunity that it yields for all the students enrolled in campus. Uh, we are aligning the bell schedule to the high school. As Director Schwab mentioned, it is a satellite program from the high school. So it belongs in the high school, but we're offering a different setting for the students who may need a smaller, more intimate. And I think one of the key words for this evening is intimate experience for them to be successful. So aligning the bell schedule to the high school is going to allow us to have um, interaction if a student needs, meaning we acknowledge the fact that the student who enrolls in campus 
more than likely needs that intimate setting. But there are many students who are advanced placement caliber students who should have an option to go to the high school. And by aligning the schedules, we will uh, be afforded the opportunity to bust the students over at a set period of that class offering. Additionally, a lot of our students at campus, from what I've gathered, are involved in a, a myriad of extracurricular activities from sports and academics, not to mention a few which are the paid programs, um, offerings, and the proximity to the high school is also going to make their transition to extracurricular and extended day activities much easier. So one of the few uh, uh, benefits and pros to the shift, um, we traditionally serve 80, we can go up to uh, 80, we have approximately 60 students now for the more intimate transition. I think another key word aside from intimacy is transition because there is a gold ticket that I'm going to refer to in a moment. So aside from the alignment, our staff is listed below. And also when it comes to the shared staff, we see the point sixes. Those teachers teach elsewhere, right? So most of them come from the high school. So it also alleviates the travel between schools for our professional staff. If we can go to the next slide, we'll see the big picture, right? When it comes to the strategic connections. So if you see on the top header that we are looking at the instruction, we're looking at the access and equity for all students, safety and security, which I'm gonna speak quite a bit about in a moment, and our long range planning. So short-term immediate uh, pros, but also the long-term. Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Moreau. Uh, one of my colleagues says that they can't see the presentation. Can you guys see this presentation? I can. Yeah, all of you can. Ms. Mer Ms. Relkin, you're the only one who can't. I don't know I why. Can. You can't? I can't, I don't know why it says Amy Mazzelli has started sh screen sharing. That's all I see. Um, okay, so follow on the board docs, open it up and follow on board docs. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. So outside of the header, I wanna really focus on the top line and the top line, the first row going across in white speaks to safety. I'm a firm believer that it's safety before learning. I know you may say, what does that mean? That's a assistant super of CNI speaking. I don't see how we can educate a student or even as a parent feel comfortable if we're sending a student and we're not 100% secure about their well-being. I think that's first and paramount. Um, and then we can engage in innovative learning. Um, access to the main campus and resources, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the proximity to New Rochelle High School, uh, the site that we're moving to, aside from it being a lot more vibrant and no disrespect to the site that we're coming from, right? So I respect the historical perspectives and forgive me if it comes off uh, inappropriate or insensitive, but uh, the few times that I visited and I've had quite a bit of tours, thanks to Director Schwab, I got the sense of it being a gloomy learning environment, not conducive to uh, a student who is uh, in the forefront of what we design this satellite academy for. Uh, this new site, very vibrant, right? Um, in comparison to where we're coming from. And I think the bigger picture is what we need to look at, right? So I said the gold ticket, the gold ticket, what's, what's in the long term in terms of campus and where it can evolve into. So the gold ticket is really the gold door. So I'm foreshadowing. I think some of you understand what the gold doors are, right? Um, why the move? Why the move in terms of instruction? I've learned and it's documented that there has been several cancellation of classes due to facilities at our previous site or our current site that we're moving out of. As an educator and even as a parent and as a student, as a learner, it's unacceptable, right? One class is too many, right? If we're going into a facility that is not only vibrant and welcoming, but state endorsed and state approved and sort of state compliance is going to ensure us that class will go on as scheduled. And in case of an emergency, because emergencies do happen, hey, we're in a long-term emergency now this spring, the, re the proximity to the high school is our buffer, right? Students should have an option for food, uh, food services. And uh, this new site provides a cafeteria that we're going to use as a multi-purpose room, but just simply it being uh, assembly point for, uh, for food and anything that has to do with lunch or uh, breakfast. Most importantly, I like the fact that this is not a shared ranch. When I say shared ranch, a previous site, there were other activities happening. You no know, un, uh, unidentified individuals, and more importantly for us as educators, un, uh, individuals, whether they're students or adults who were not fingerprinted in close proximity to our learners, back to the safety and security and the insecurity that a parent or a student may have 
whether they're aware of it or even unbeknownst to them. Its own academy, a sheltered environment, its own ranch. As a former principal, I was one of the lucky ones that had their own ranch. And I of us and the imaginary divider that is the hallway. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to shift to our digital citizenship. And what I mean is mention our one-to-one -one initiative and it will begin with the high school. We as re how it is definitely a uh, prerequisite to our scenario two, which is distance learning, a continuation in Bethesda the fact that we do not may, although there is one, have a computer room, I think that's passe, right? Students and with technology, it's uh, preparing them for where they should have been. And we would have been in a much better space if we were there uh, before the pandemic hit. I mentioned the gold ticket in turn, Garrett, I was referring to are the gold doors of City Hall. So if we can not endure, right? make this intimate experience the best that it can be for our students, what potentially two, three, four years down the road, depending on how quickly we can move folks out, right? Our good neighbors, but also um, redesign. City Hall will welcome campus and even morph it into whatever it can become. So uh, Director Schwab, you and I, and the superintendent has spoken about what that potentially can be. And I know that you have a vision for that at City Hall. Um, and I can't stress enough the importance of an intimate environment. I know many larger schools that are broken down into campuses. It's because of the attention. So we go from an 80 of a student population to a more secure and intimate and purposeful educational experience. I think it is a no brainer. And I think the icing on the cake is the fact that we're potentially gonna have a palace that we're gonna call home two or three years from now. So that is uh, a bit of what the instruction will look like, thanks to the planning of interim, soon to be interim principal Goldberg, along with Director Schwab, in terms of the alignment of the program, but also uh, the facilities. Um, I want to turn it over to Mr. Thurnow, who's uh, okay. the facilities and the operations that go along with. Thank you, Dr. Marrero. Uh, I would start by um, discussing. Um, the uh, some photos of the current situation and then we'll move into the next. Uh, I would also uh, like to uh, share that when the district did the previous building condition survey in the year 2015 in preparation for the $106 million capital bond, uh, we did do a building condition survey of campus and the cost to uh, move the facility into an acceptable condition were over $2 million in uh, 2015 uh, prices. Um, so the building was rated in 2015 as unsatisfactory, and we uh, came to understand that that is an appropriate rating based on the, the uh, number of times, uh, as Dr. Marrero alluded to, that we did have to close down school with uh, little to no notice. There were a number of emergencies, particularly and most often with the heating system. Um, there were times when the boilers simply failed. There were other times when substantial steam leaks throughout the facility uh, caused the system to shut down. In one case, the steam leaks were so significant that it uh, completely buckled and ruined the gymnasium floor. Um, and in one case, they simply ran out of oil in the tank. And so there was obviously no way that the boilers could operate and we were forced to shut down school on multiple occasions. And so again, uh, as Dr. Murrow suggested, that interrupts and impacts uh, the educational program in a significant manner. So uh, on the left, this is just a screenshot of the uh, entrance to the campus school. The second photo is a typical classroom. And then the third photo is a typical hallway. And I tried to arrange the photos in a chronolo chronological order. So you will see similar photos as we move through to the uh, proposed uh, site. So, Doc, uh, Amy, uh, Doc, uh, President Moselle, excuse me, if you will move to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, here's another set of images for the current location. The left hand slide shows the uh, kitchen that we currently use. It is part of the cafeteria. We don't actually have a kitchen. The uh, the stainless steel items in the corner that you see are basically warming ovens that we use 
to uh, deliver food from the high school and then rewarm it uh, for the students in that, uh, in that program. The middle slide shows the, uh, the reverse of the first slide. In other words, I turn around and that is the, caf the, the cafeteria room that is used by the students. And then the third photo just shows the, a, a typical bathroom at campus uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's dated. It needs to be uh, updated and brightened up quite a bit. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows, uh, again, similar images. Uh, the first slide is the front entrance. Uh, the second slide is a, a classroom at uh, Bethesda location, and this happens to be the art room. It has a vaulted ceiling, and uh, you can see nice bright light coming in. Uh, there's very little construction required, very little modification required to make this facility satisfy our needs. And in one case we will install sinks here in this art room and in one other location which is the science room uh, and on the right hand photo is a typical uh, corridor uh, in the proposed location at Bethesda and uh, next slide so the left slide here is a photo of a uh, of a what we'll call a flexible space a multi-purpose space it can be used for anything from uh, the cafeteria to uh, a music program. Uh, there is currently a piano in the corner of this space that uh, is not visible in the photograph. Uh, the church uses it for this uh, music uh, as well on occasion for practice and so forth. The second slide is an, a slide of a uh, full service kitchen that we have full access to as part of the uh, terms of the lease. So in talking with Whitson's as our food service provider, they will be able to provide and offer the same uh, meal uh, options and packages as are currently offered at the high school. And we uh, can additionally install a point of sale uh, here so that they can buy a la carte and or their entire lunch as they deem fit. The photo on the right hand side is of what uh, is called um, the banquet room on the second floor of the family uh, center where we will be located. It has a stage to the left there and uh, this space is available to us for uh, music presentations and uh, theater presentations or, or full school assemblies. Uh, however, it's uh, not used on a normal daily basis by students, but we have full access to it when we need it for special events. And then the next slide, please. Uh, the left slide here is a, uh, a, a, a space that's currently used by, as a library and a, a computer lab. Uh, we will likely reconfigure that space and uh, the administrators at the school will determine whether uh, this uh, remains uh, as a library space and or an office space. Uh, it's directly across from the bulk of the classrooms in the uh, location, so they may choose to use it as an office, so they're centrally located. The middle slide is simply a photo of the front entrance lobby. Uh, that circular desk will get pulled farther out into the room, and we will um, uh, occupy that desk with our security staff. There will uh, be other security staff in the facility, the same staff that we currently use at campus, and we will um, increase that staff if we deem it necessary once uh, we're operational and we identify any other issues of concern. And then the third uh, photo is simply a uh, photo of the uh, of a typical restroom at the Bethesda location, which does show that it has been updated uh, and they uh, are current and the stalls are have been adjusted for uh, accessibility and so forth. So that's just uh, a sampling of the various photos of the facility. Um, Next slide talks about frequently asked questions and uh, some of these um, um, I may have spoken about. Um, and for your information, the uh, gray buttons on the uh, left side and across the bottom is, is uh, a key, if you will. The gray, gray buttons are neutral. Green we view as improvements. Uh, a red, a red uh, identification is a trade-off and purple is, uh, is not particularly applicable to the, to the situation. So there will be sinks in both the art room and the science rooms. The um, art room will have two sinks, one for hand washing and one for art materials, and the science room will have one sink. Uh, certificates of occupancy uh, for the space. Of course, the church does have a current certificate of occupancy 
with the city as is their requirement as all uh, city uh, city uh, facilities are required to have current certificates of occupancy. For a public school district, we are required to have two certificates of occupancy when we are not in a school owned site. So yes, we have a city certificate of occupancy and then we submit and have the proposed space approved by the state education department, which is the authority having jurisdiction. That's a technical term for uh, code compliance so the state education as the authority having jurisdiction will review and is reviewing our plans and will provide our second certificate of occupancy which allows the private space to be used for public school students uh, the next question is where are we specifically with the process all of our documentation has been submitted to both the state education department and the city and we don't anticipate any uh, issues. There may be minor changes, uh, but uh, we, uh, myself, as well as the design team, have significant experience working with the state education department. And uh, while it is possible there may be minor uh, revisions to the uh, existing plans, we don't anticipate any uh, issues that would prevent any occupancy or approval for use in September. The next slide. Oh, uh, how many security cameras will be at the site? There will be six installed in strategic locations so that we can view the front entrance, the hallways, and uh, the large uh, uh, cafeteria space that uh, can be used as uh, the multi-purpose room, as we mentioned. Uh, so we're confident that that uh, will cover the space as necessary. Uh, the key fob system, uh, in this case, we don't believe that's necessary. Uh, this is still going to be used by the church in the evenings and the weekends, uh, and therefore we will be provided with keys for administrators, security, and custodial services. And this is similar to the way that the current facilities operate, because once the facilities are shut down, if a teacher were to return, then they would set, uh, set off the alarm system. So if a teacher does need to return to the, the new location, then we would simply have to uh, uh, attend to them, open the facility uh, so that they can gain access. And we would have to do that at any other school in any regard so that the uh, burglar alarm system was not set off. Uh, I did mention security staffing. We will provide the same security staffing at campus as we do at the current, or excuse me, at Bethesda as we do at the current campus location. And uh, we will in fact uh, review the operations once we are operational and determine whether or not there are any additions that need to be made. And I think there's one or two more slides on frequently asked questions. So uh, without a gymnasium, how will PE classes be held? And so there's some answers here. Uh, Boys and Girls Club uh, will be accessible to us for one and or two years while they are in the process of um, composing their future plans there. We also have the use of Lincoln Park in good weather. Uh, we can use the cafeteria slash uh, multi-purpose space for other PE activities like dance or instruction on sports regarding the rules and sports ethics and things of that nature that don't require uh, physical uh, uh, activity. Um, there's also the possibility of, of other things like ping pong tables, for example, to uh, get the kids up and moving around. Uh, and then, of course, it's possible to have uh, access to the high school uh, for specific activities if, ne if necessary or if desired. And the final question is, yes, uh, the board did visit the site last evening, uh, and I'm sure that they're available for questions if anybody has anything specific there. Um, what will the classroom spaces look like? Uh, so there has been concern raised uh, about the, uh, the, there are folding partitions and, and uh, um, fold, those folding partitions are located between some of the classrooms, and there has been mis- uh, interpretation that those are open above and so the noise can carry. In fact, they are not open above the partitions. The partitions do seal off those classrooms uh, against the ceiling and the floor. And we are confident that the sound is not excessive. The uh, individual classrooms will only have on, uh, on average, you know, eight to 10 students as, as many as uh, up to 15. Um, and we don't think that that's going to be an issue based on the limited class size. But again, once operational, if there are concerns raised about sound levels, we can install additional soundproofing blankets along those folding uh, partition walls. 
the other improvements uh, that we are going to make are data drops for each space. There will be our uh, smart boards moved from the campus location. We're going to provide wireless communications. Uh, we already have all of those devices, and if uh, if they're not currently present in campus, we'll provide those, but we anticipate being able to move all of the devices from campus. Uh, we will be connecting the school district to our uh, uh, VoIP over IP phone system so that there will be uh, communications available in each classroom and each space and so forth. Um, the, uh, Dr. Marrero talked about the practice of going to one-to-one -one, uh, initiative with our technology, and that's going to be rolled out to campus students. And uh, science lab, there is a, a room designated as a science lab that will also have a sink. And the administrators and the, the educational side of the house is, is acquiring the appropriate uh, uh, cart, a very comprehensive science cart that has all the needs that a, uh, a high school curriculum requires. And uh, if there's any questions there, I believe Dr. Marrow, you can speak to more, more to that. And again, as I mentioned, there is an art room available. Uh, we believe that that art room can also be used as multi-purpose and scheduled accordingly uh, for music or any other activity. Um, quite honestly, the music might be best in the uh, cafeteria where it's farther removed from the other educational spaces. Uh, and we have secured appropriate storage so that musical instruments and digital keyboards and all those types of things can be properly secured and, and locked. Uh, how will students get to and from campus? Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Fehu can help me out where necessary, uh, but if there is a need to travel to the high school, uh, we will be uh, edu uh, excuse me, uh, uh, attending those students. They won't be released to go on their own. And we're still looking at that, whether uh, if there's time in the schedule, it's a 23 minute walk, or whether we would have to provide transportation. We've looked into and can discuss you know, purchasing a van for that activity as opposed to having to contract uh, with the bus company um, and then uh, access to after school activities and sports programs. Again, that's all under discussion, but um, being that the facility is closer to the high school than the current location, uh, we should be able to work that out without a significant issue. And then finally, uh, are there parking spaces available? Yes, there are 30 parking spaces available and those are uh, sufficient to cover not only the teaching staff, but administrators and custodial and uh, security staff as well. I think there's another one, yes. Uh, additional benefits. So um, again, some of this has been discussed previously, but security at the facility uh, is optimal as we will be the only day program uh, occurring during this uh, uh, time period for this location. Uh, we we uh, believe the space is clean and well-maintained and we will be providing our own custodial staff as we currently do. And we will apply the same cleaning and disinfectant protocols that we currently use in all of our schools. Another significant improvement is that we do have a full kitchen at our uh, disposal and we will be providing a food service uh, with our existing Whit Whitman's, uh, uh, Whitson's, excuse me, custodial uh, huh, lunch program. So we are talking to them about being able to uh, gear up for that. And as I mentioned, the point of sale uh, activity so that they can obtain the, the services that they want uh, as opposed to trying to order the night before and deliver box meals and things like that. So that's gonna be a significant improvement. Again, proximity to the high school and city hall. Um, is a, is a benefit. Uh, and finally, no known heating issues. Uh, I have talked to this specifically about the facility. Uh, their systems appear to be in good shape. Uh, I apologize for the uh, language in that. We do not expect to have to close school for heating issues. There's a couple of extra words in there that are not necessary, but uh, we are not aware of and do not expect to have uh, emergency conditions with respect to the heating system which again, we have had on numerous occasions in the past. Capital improvements needed at, at, at what cost? And as you can see, uh, while this is a trade-off as a red dot, uh, we estimate that the capital investment that we need to make is less than $50,000 for all the data drops and the sinks in the art room and science rooms and uh, any other uh, improvements we need to make. Uh, however, as I previously mentioned at the beginning, 
Uh, the current campus location estimated costs were over $2 million in two, 2015 dollars. So that is certainly escalated approximately 3% a year. Uh, and so that uh, is a significantly less cost to uh, improve this facility for our, for our years. Um, what was the process? Um, we uh, met with administrators of the school, uh, Dr. Uh, Fehu and myself. I reviewed it as the director of facilities for our needs. I met with our architects and engineers to ensure that the facility could be easily adapted uh, for our use. And then of course the administrator, uh, administration worked with the church um, administrators to uh, make sure that we could come to a mutual understanding about the use of the property. Uh, and then of course we have submitted the required paperwork to state ed as well as the city. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna open it up to our colleagues and if you don't mind Dr. Beho, given that there were three presenters, uh, maybe the person who's closest to the question, uh, if you don't mind allowing your other, um, you know, the other people in the district to respond, uh, I think some colleagues might want to hear directly from people who, who are, you know, have a straight line to the question. Absolutely, so, positively. All right, thank you. Uh, open up to my colleagues for questions. Does anyone have questions? Okay, I see, I see Ms. Merchant and I see Ms. Uh, Ms. Oaks. Oh, sorry, Ms. Okay. This question is uh, for Dr. Marrero. Um, you mentioned the AP courses. I just want to know exactly how many of the campus students do you anticipate taking advantage of the AP courses next year and which courses, AP courses, those students would be interested in that actually are available and offered during the eighth period and how they might get there in 23 minutes after, how, how are they supposed, how are they to get there in time for the class? Great question. So I'll start with uh, the tr transportation um, and I'm gonna ask uh, Director Schwab to possibly shed light on the current uh, student population and perhaps their interests since she's the most familiar. Um, in terms of the transportation, 23 minute walk, right? But ideally when it comes to, a, it's gonna be case by case, Ms. Merchant, right? So if a student who is in campus has shown uh, an appreciation for or a talent in, then that student is going to be individually programmed just like every high school student is. And that will indicate when that transportation will ha happen, right? So if it's a group of students, ideally, um, I'm not seeing the 23 minutes. I'm really looking at the four minute transition time that we're mirroring with the high school and how uh, I know when I leave City Hall, I get there in six minutes, but granted I have to find uh, parking. Uh, so if it's an immediate drop off, I think that we can get close, clearly not four minutes, but in terms of instructional time loss, it will be minimal. It will be non-existent if it's around the student's lunch period. So it's, it will be case by case. Uh, Director Straub, maybe you can shed a little bit of light of what the interests are in your current population, but I know without uh, being intimately connected with uh, the interests of the students, I would say for all our secondary students, it's case by case, right? Um, and the guidance counselors are instrumental in identifying where the passion is or interest in or even proficiency in, in terms of challenging. And if it's not offered an A site, then the high school is where they will be transported to. Uh, Director Schwab, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, at this time, we do not have any students who are interested in any AP courses or if they've not expressed that. So I think this is an opportunity, all right? So if, if it's offered and it's part of the menu, as they say, then I'm wondering how many would say, well, I will love to take a stab at, or perhaps I can be successful in, tell me how you can support. So as a former you know, counselor, I would welcome that conversation with the student. So that's, I think, another pro for the ship. Yeah, I, like what, I like what you just said, Dr. Moreau, because that speaks to our commitment to a growth mindset tell children that they're able, encourage them to, and provide them options. Uh, Ms. Merchant, I think you had another question. Oh, yeah, and so I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, this could be great for the students to aspire to do more. Um, so Dr. Marrero, another thing you mentioned was the safety and security. 
And I want to know when some of the students are coming to and from school, will the security be afforded them? Because maybe this is a well kept secret or not, but it's pretty well known by the police that some of the students are not going to be as happy to travel by foot down that portion of Lincoln, Lincoln Avenue. And it's just a fact. You can check it with the, the police, et cetera. So if there were to be some concerns about the kids, some of the kids coming from different parts of town by foot, how is security going to uh, handle those situations and help those students? Will they be able to come outside and, and, and extend some greetings to them or help escort them? Or what, what do you see happening there? Great. So uh, while you were asking the question, I know our superintendent was nodding because that has been a point of conversation um, with the walk to uh, the Boys and Girls Club in terms of an escort that's been part of the conversation, but also in terms of the welcome and the dismissal. Um, if it need be, that's something that is in the works, right? Perhaps not for the launch, because I think, no, the welcome should be part of, uh, let's, let's let the school community and the school zone do what it naturally does. It morphs into a different uh, atmosphere in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Uh, but we are prepared to provide any support in terms of the safety of the students. I just, I just want to add, so for certain, when an option is not available, kids might not demonstrate interest. And so we don't anticipate for September that this would be necessarily something that students would be opting for. But we know our students have potential to do this. And when options are on the table, we counsel them, we advise them, we help them think about what the opportunities are. And so how we figure out individual student programs and give them opportunities and a menu that's a little broader is one uh, circumstance. And then we are both looking at the uh, transport, you know, supervision if they are walking, but we are also looking into the idea of regular transportation, as Mr. Thurnau mentioned, in possibly a minivan or something that we can get students there. And we do this to some degree with BOCES as well. When students are interested in a half day program at BOCES, we build it into their schedule. And we know this is a group of students where we can be creative in programming. And so maybe there's an opportunity to have an earlier schedule or an afternoon schedule where we can accommodate the time to ensure students get to classes that are now options for them moving forward. I'm sorry to follow up, but I just was listening. Um, and yes, it is true that I have advocated for the, for the campus school to have better facilities and in better locations. So that is true. Um, but Dr. Marrero, you also mentioned uh, intimate several times in your presentation. And when I looked at the classrooms, they seemed extremely small to me because you, as you know, these are full grown adult size students. Um, how, how many can fit and comfortably, and if you had to socially distance, what, how, how does that take hold for the 80s, for the, uh, well, now 60, but growing to 80 students. How do you, how do you see that happening? So at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, we're at 60, right? And if we have eight spaces, we're looking at less than 10 students per space. And, and those spaces, although smaller than a traditional classroom, are adequate to accommodate eight to 10 students. Um, in terms of social distancing, I think that in our reentry plans, we're going to govern not only what's going to happen in campus, all schools, right? So uh, that's going to be addressed not only for campus, for all schools. And I think we're doing great work, if I can say so myself. Kudos to all the chairs and all the uh, reentry plans. So I'm going to let that uh, govern on how we function outside of an executive order from the governor. So whatever we instill, even if in an intimate uh, group of less students, same in the high school, and we have you know, 20 plus uh, students who are, you're right, taller than all of us, right, in a cramped, small high school classroom, because there are some tight uh, classrooms in, in the high school as well. So we'll take the same procedures when it comes to that. But back in terms of the access, something that truly resonated with me in terms of opportunity, and Dr. Fay, who you mentioned it, um, if there isn't any interest now from the students who are enrolled, I'm wondering if they, when they decided to have the more intimate setting, which is campus, that they figured that it was part of the deal that didn't have an opportunity to take an advanced course. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, then we have to we have to rectify that. Even if it wasn't 
the message if that's how they internalize it. So back to what President Mozelli said in terms of mindset, I believe in equal opportunity. So the fact that you may need this is, goes to with everything that was happening in a classroom. So we look at the L's, we look at our students with special needs the same way, just because you may need support in one area of your educational journey doesn't preclude you from the opportunity to access all. So I believe the shift in itself, the proximity is gonna allow us the opportunity to get creative. It's not, it's not an easy fix because it can really become uh, problematic if we have a much uh, a, a diverse group of students who really want access and it's a one through eight problem, right? That means that we're gonna have to get on the pony back and forth, but something that we're willing to accommodate because now it's opportunity that students at campus have been afforded. And it seems as if that it was not part of the option, at least it wasn't articulated to them, and that we, we need to start that immediately. So can I address one of the space uh, questions, uh, Dr. Mero? The space can accommodate uh, a larger number of students. We talked yesterday that it officially could accommodate a large number, but between 15 and 17 is actually, uh, Mr. Thurnow, not a problem in any one of the spaces that would be the classroom spaces. There are some offices and other spaces that won't be general classrooms, but in any one of the ones we've designated as a classroom could very easily fit 15 to 17. I know you said legally 49, which we would never do, um, but that 15 that's, that's to 17 correct. with that's the furniture. Correct. There is adequate space for 15 to 17 kids. You are correct. Legally, the code would allow as much as 49 persons because that's it's based on different items in the code, we would never do that educationally, uh, but it's that it, that is acceptable from a safety and an exiting standpoint. However, these spaces uh, are, are well served for 15 to 17 students. So, so in the intimate setting in the rooms and so forth, is, is a room for teacher desks and their, and their um, materials for the students? Are there, is there a room for individual students? Uh, teachers to have desks in those rooms? Yes, yeah, so so what we have to do is, the, the, the key in this uh, situation is that uh, we are not, um, we are not maintaining this space as ours permanently. The church will be using it in the evening. So we are acquiring furniture that is going to be satisfactory for both of our needs and the church's needs so that we don't have to break down and store our furniture at the end of every day and they don't have to tear, uh, break out and set up their equipment, uh, their furniture every day. So we're acquiring furniture that's satisfactory for both needs and therefore teachers will have the availability to do that. And we're providing lockable storage cabinets in each location for them. But will they have a permanent desk in each classroom that's not going to be disturbed? No, that's not the case. Okay. Um, so, and we know there's not going to be a library, but so in one instance, you've got an English teacher that has a collection of novels for the students to read. So where, what are we thinking in terms of the storage of those books and how we might be able to transport those books into the, into the English classroom setting so that those books can be distributed for the classes? How have we thought about that and arranging that logistically? Um, well, again, from my perspective, we, we need to talk specifically about that with the school administration, but we will be able to provide lockable and secure storage in each one of the locations. I would like to and add also, also. Oh, yeah, I was going to say there's also storage areas downstairs that we can determine usage. I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Dr. Morero? No, I was going to shift into the digital world, right? So in terms of digital libraries and the access in which uh, I know that there is a need for tactile, right? So those of us who want to feel and touch, so we have to respect that. And uh, as we just heard that there will be storage available, but uh, with the one-to-one -one initiative, students will have everything in that classroom and everything that they would imagine in their Chromebook in a virtual cloud. Um, I want to also address in terms of the, the, the safety piece, and I said in, that it would be available if needed, but not at the launch, and here's why I feel strongly about that. When I led a, a school, it was in the most undesirable place in the Bronx, and everything that you can imagine that was happening outside of those four walls was happening, right? Uh, deaths and drugs and everything you can imagine. Um, however, what happened inside of the building is what made sure that the students were safe. So when I mentioned safety, I was talking about safety within the building. And I believe students who are interested to come to school, invested, and have someone who's an adult who cares about them, intimate, that they're going to make sure that they're inside of the building. 
Um, and that changes the culture. I've seen it and I've done it. I've led that charge. So I want to launch with uh, you know, welcoming our students and the students and the magic happens. However, we will be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that we have to be ready to support if needed. So we've spoken about it, but it will not be part of our launch because I think it sends a wrong message to the community, but more importantly to our students. Uh, let them change the learning environment and the community around them. And speaking of launching and launching the day, the students had the use of an indoor gymnasium where some of the, them could sometimes come in early for school, nice and happily, and have a game, nice game around ball and get warmed up and ready and, and get the kinks worked out before they sc start school. Because you know, you know this already, athletics um, helps you maintain your, your poise, your calm, it gets you focused and many of the students need that, many of the adults need that. It's, it's so to not have that is going to be a considerable uh, loss. And they also have um, a Nautilus machine over there and treadmills and free weights. So a lot of that has to do with keeping focus and keeping even temperament and, and not having the access to that is gonna be a challenge, I would think. It, it can, it depends on how we look at it, I believe. Um, I know that the Boys and Girls Club, the executive director was incredibly welcoming before I can even get the request out of uh, my mouth. She said, absolutely, as long as it's erect, meaning as long as the building stands. So perhaps we can have access beforehand, but I'm concerned about the escort to and from, especially uh, if we're not right around our school building, that basketball game will go into a rematch and a rematch and the bell rings and you miss period one. So I am very cognizant of that because I had to usher students in uh, the hard way to make sure that uh, the, fun and, uh, the fun and games uh, will continue a little bit later in the day. Um, in terms of the activities, although we may not have the weight room, right? Uh, we definitely have the open space out in the park and what I mentioned, the Boys and Girls Club, but the multi-purpose room, and I know some folks may frown on it. I frowned on it. I was a baseball player. I want to still claim that I am a baseball player, right? Uh, I'm over the hill. However, when I was giving yoga, I was up in arms saying, how dare you, professor, guidance counselor, give me yoga? But then it opened my eyes in terms of diversifying my understanding of what physical activity could be. So aside from yoga, we that multi, uh, the multi-purpose room can also offer ping pong, and that's been in the works as well. Different activities that can also open the eyes of students who, quite frankly, may only know what they've been exposed to, uh, but perhaps uh, spark another interest in, in a student. So we're accommodating to breaking what and I hate to call the educational process monotony, but the traditional period one to eight and uh, making opportunities perhaps different in the way of what they're accustomed to, but definitely offering them that break, that, that physical break and that mental break. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Oaks. Hi. Um, I want to acknowledge that um, from my first meeting, our first meeting with Dr. Fejo, she did um, voice concern about the current space at St. Gabe's. And I appreciate that this has been weighing on her um, all these months. Um, but given that, uh, that actually also raises concerns for me about why community engagement did not happen, uh, especially for the families, because I know that this was something you were thinking about, the appropriateness of the current location. But I had, do have a question. One thing that really uh, stuck, you know, really struck me was the fact that 30% of these students have IEPs. Why is that? Why, why do they have IEPs? Why 30% is a bare, it's much higher than our district average for IEPs. I want to understand why 30% of these kids at campus have IEPs. Um, can I just piggyback on that question as well? And maybe um, Dr. Feo or Dr. Morero, if you can also clarify um, similar alternative campuses in other districts whether or not the IEP percentage changes at uh, alternative campuses, if, if that is just a, a nature of the, the type of school that it is, or if it's specific to New Rochelle. Uh, so 
I'll just start by saying there is a likelihood and, you know, Director Schwach knows the students uh, certainly more intimately, but there is a likelihood that there is uh, some supports, additional supports that are provided for parents who have students that may be struggling in one area or another that provides that opportunity at the smaller setting at campus school. You know, everyone here knows that the, each individual plan has specifics to a student. So I wouldn't want to categorize them, but I would think that this alternate location, the smaller size, the more intimate classrooms by just by numbers and by the interactions of the whole, that there's only 80 students at max versus the number that we have at the high school is probably a more attractive uh, location. Because as we know, parents opt into that location for students who are having struggles. So what I imagine a certain portion of those students, this is a better location based on their needs and their identified um, disabilities or abilities to utilize the campus school. And so that would be my guesstimate, although we know that every range of each student with an IEP has totally different uh, strengths and things we want to compensate to support them with. Um so I'll tell you what my concern is, my major concern seeing that number of 30%. Mm -hmm. It makes me really question if we're being faithful to least restrictive environment for these students. It makes me question that. Um, and, you know, I, it's just, it, to me, um, and given the outcome, I would love to know the outcomes mm -hmm. for these kids in this program. When was the last time a real audit, a thorough audit of the program happened? I would love to know like the per pupil cost. Right. Uh, what, um, what are the outcomes? Uh, you know, do what percentage of kids graduate with a Regents diploma? Sure from so, this program. Sorry, so I wanna um, say something that maybe we didn't say explicitly and directly that I think is really important. For so long, I think the reference to this being an alternative school, we have to be really clear that every student in campus school gets the same diploma as any student in our regular high school. That the requirements, that the program, that everything is the same. So we have consultant teaching, which is a less restrictive environment at campus school. It's a solid model that's utilized for some of our students. And so the site and the place in which they attend is not a more restrictive environment. As you know, less restrictive environment has to do with the number of periods and the assignment of program to a student. It's not a locational thing. So I do not think that campus school is a more restrictive environment just because you have more classes with less students. I think it's a more attractive environment for certain students with specific needs. But it Except is- Except for the fact that at the at Nourishell High School, I don't know what percentage of the kids at Nourishell High School have IEPs, but it's certainly quite lower than the percentage of kids at campus. So that in itself does create a dynamic of in terms of least restrictive. But, I think I, I think Ms. Oaks's point is very valid. I think that you know, in the same way that we did sort of like the phase one analysis, phase two analysis for all of the schools, and I think Ms. Schwab did one for campus school as well, and it's online. Um, I, the, 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 the idea about how we're educating students and what the curriculum is and what, when the last curriculum audit happened is really very important questions. I agree. And I, I definitely think it's something that we should delve into and, and maybe Ms. Schw uh, Ms. Schwab can help us do that in the next you know, uh, few months or so. But uh, whatever the system is that is educating the students at campus school, um, it's not going to improve or, or, or change just based on the building that those kids are in. That's a really important series of questions that Ms. Oaks is talking about, which is strategic and pro you know, program related and instructional. But uh, those questions are they're, they're not answered by if we're at one location or another. It's a deeper, more strategic question. And the question that we're talking about today is location. Um, but I think that the questions that Ms. Oaks is talking about, we should, we should address at some point. Absolutely. Which is why I'm voting no 
by the way, it's why I'm voting no on this move, because I do not believe we have been strategic in our thinking. We have not been collaborative. We have not reached out to families who are directly impacted. Our staff have not been involved. This is a pattern that I'm seeing, and I'm telling you, I'm gonna start voting no a lot. I'm gonna start voting no a lot, because unless we really involve the stakeholders, I'm a no, and I need to see it. I need to see that it's not perfunctory, that it's not like, uh, oh, we did a survey. No, I need to see true collaboration if you're ever, ever going to get a yes out of me. That's it, I'm done. Thank you. Next, anyone else have a question? Ms. Williams. Or mute. I think she calls on you, Ms. Williams. You're mute. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Mr. Thurnow, Dr. Marrero, and Director Schwack for all of the information. It was like a lot of information. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And also uh, Dr. Fejo for elaborating. So that was great. And like, and Dr. Marrero, in your presentation, uh, you mentioned um, a term that I never heard before. So I would like you just to, you know, explain what it is and it's shared ranch. What does that mean? You're muted. Oh. So, no, no, I, no, I'm sorry, Dr. Marrero is muted. No, he's muted. Yeah, no, I am, I am. Shared sorry. ranch. So uh, uh, as uh, principals, I'm gonna still identify as a school leader. Uh, we call our building, our learning environment ranches, some of us do, right? Okay. And, and a lot of uh, situations in which uh, schools are broken down or have satellite programs, or even when a school is really broken down into totally different entities and is created as a campus, not like this campus, but a campus in which several schools exist, that's what a shared ranch is. So when we say I'm taking it back to the ranch, I was one of the fortunate principals who had my own building, right? And there's nothing like it in terms of your community. So that's what I'm referring to a shared ranch. And although there wasn't another alternative uh, school at the site uh, at St. Gabe's, I understand there were different usage happening at, at the same location, right? So mm -hmm. that will not be the case um, during the school hour, during the school days at the desert, from what I understand, the activities will continue on weekends and weekends, not conflicting with the academic school day. Oh, okay. Thank you for the explanation because like the word ranch, when you're talking about like our kids being put on a ranch, that could have no. some negative no. connotation. As oh, no, sure. absolutely. I'm sorry if you take it like that. We also, yeah. as principals, uh, I'm taking it back to the ranch and we're referring to our school building. Yeah. And sorry, also, um, again, thank you so much for all of this information. And um, we we're seeing so much information and um, there are so many questions, um, you know, um, like my colleague uh, voiced her concerns and um, community members have been voicing their concerns to me. So um, President Moselle, would it be possible for us to table the vote today so that we have time to digest and also have time for community engagement um, before we vote on this important decision? Well, in order to do that, you would need a motion and a second. But in terms of getting true community engagement, I don't want to um, leave with a false narrative. We have a deadline to inform St. Gabriel's of our decision by June 30th. And so the time for thoughtful uh, engagement with the community has, has unfortunately passed. And I think what the superintendent is hearing or should be hearing is that, you know, I for one support this and I'll be voting in the affirmative, but it's just very unfortunate that when such a great thing is happening for our students, really transformative in so many ways, that there's this cloud of negativity over it, which, which would never have happened if this process was handled in a, in a better way. It, I feel like you put the board in a really unfair position. Um, you know, you're offering a wonderful option. It's obvious that Mr. Thurnow, who everybody respects, has worked on this for six months. It's obvious that Dr. Marrero and it's obvious that Ms. Schwach are very vested in this move. And because you decided to do this, you know, without even informing the board along the way, um, I, for one, find myself in a position where I'm absolutely supporting it in spite of your management style, not because of your management style. 
And it could have been a moment where the community came together and really celebrated this really wonderful um, thing that you're doing, something that superintendents before you wanted to do. And uh, it's very unfortunate that we find ourselves where we are. One of the reasons, Ms. Williams, that um, I really considered seriously um, whether or not postponing the vote was a good idea was, uh, you know, in part because it's 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 smoke and mirrors. To to if we postpone the vote for three days, four days, nothing's going to change. The data is not going to change. The presentation Mr. Thornout did isn't going to change. There's not an alternative option that the board is really looking at in any serious way. And so the board. The board is put in a really unfortunate position. And it's also very unfair to Bethesda, who's also been invested for six months plus. Their congregation has been invested emotionally for six months plus. We talk about equity, we talk about access, we talk about uh, understanding what, it, what has happened to the Lincoln District, the Lincoln Corridor, the Lincoln Attendance Zone. We talk about the lack of a school there and what that means for a district not to have a heart, not to have a location. The board moved. Board, uh, you know, board meetings to the Lincoln Corridor um, three years ago under the leadership. I think it was under Ms. Relkin's leadership because we we understood that that area was an area that the district have, had overlooked for so many years. And uh, when we even went to that play that happened at the Boys and Girls Club, part of the uh, protest that happened as a part of the play was to bring education back, to bring a heart back to the center of a district that has been gutted for years. And it could have been so positive. And unfortunately, although the, the solution is clear for me and I'm a resounding yes, you robbed me, Dr. Feho, and I believe you robbed the board from the opportunity to rejoice in this in a way that uh, was really our right to do so because we have been working for a moment like this for, for a very, very long time. And it may not be as important to you as it is to us or as it is to me, but I, I think that you really, um, were very unstrategic in the way that you rolled this out. And so to Ms. Williams's point, I, I, I respect her perspective. I understand her perspective. I respect Ms. Um, Oaks's perspective. Um, but truly, I believe postponing the vote elongates the pain because even if members of the community said they didn't want this because they didn't understand it or they didn't feel involved, it's not like we could create a scenario where they would suddenly be involved in five days. So what I believe needs to happen, given that there's really no option, is that we need to start the healing process. We need to, in my opinion, I'm ready to support this completely um, in spite of your leadership. And then I think that we should bring the community together and really start to facilitate conversations and tours for the parents. And there's a whole new cohort of parents that are, have not been in um, you know, uh, the, the, the campus school at all. And I think that we need to start the healing. But for me, um, although I totally respect what Ms. Williams is saying, unfortunately, the scenario we find ourselves in doesn't even authentically lend itself to an opportunity where that would really be viable. I, I hear your passion. And you know, ever since I've known you, um, you've been an advocate, uh, an advocate for the Lincoln uh, attendance zone. And um, you know, I really appreciate that because a lifelong New Rochelle, and I grew up in new attendance zone. So it's very important to me. And um, I was always um, sent to schools like sometimes we have like 28 kids in the class. I counted my sixth grade picture. I saw 28 kids in the class, but there was a lot of space. So the rooms, I was at Trinity, those rooms are big. In Jefferson, the rooms are big. And so even though, you know, there were a lot of kids, there was also a lot of space. So that was something. And um, I think that um, we have two new people coming on to our board and um, it yeah. would be great to even have their input as to what they think. So, so holding I think off on the board, I think that's, that's, today that's very, and yeah, new people no, I, I think we should address that because that point is extremely good as well. So the two new members that are coming on the board, as, as you know, because I shared with you, but I think it's worthy of public uh, comment, you know, public sharing, I contacted them and uh, I met with them with Vice President Warhead and we explained the scenario to them. And we explained to them that the reason why we would vote at all without them um, being sworn in is because of the notice to um, inform St. Gabriel's of our intention on terminating the lease, which is contractually June 30th. 
And um, they're only gonna be sworn in at the earliest July 1st, but actually the reorg meeting is July 7th. So unfortunately, because of the contractual obligation, having their voice at the table in terms of a formalized vote is not possible. But as you know, um, we met with them and we invited both of them to come to Bethesda. Um, Ms. Brooks had a, I hope she doesn't mind, but she had a, an important and pr a private matter that made her go to um, Atlanta, Georgia. And although she was a part of the Zoom meeting and, and was uh, very active uh, in asking really poignant questions, uh, much of them have been addressed in this presentation, um, Ms. Uh, Castellano did join us at the Bethesda tour. And that's not to say that she supports it, I have no idea where she stands on this matter, but um, uh, them bringing, being brought into the process to the fullest extent possible was absolutely my priority. And having Ms. Castellano um, at the tour yesterday was a wonderful thing. And, you know, we, I, unfortunately, just because of the process and because she has not been sworn in, I did ask her to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which is uh, normal. For this type of circumstance but. yeah i think that was great because you know um from what people are telling me that's a and i spoke to like um past board presidents and they said that that was something that they did so the newly elected were um invited to the executive sessions and they were given information as part of an onboarding um experience so that they would be able to hit the ground running once they were elected during the reorg um meeting and um i think that probably you know even though the, the lease does expire i'm sure there's nobody really clamoring to go to st gates and um you know and in lieu of covid everything is pushed back so i'm i don't know it's just a thought and then i just also want to share some happy news um Nourishelle, we received like um like i think it was like 10 million dollars or something like that and that money is to do renovations in the corridor. And um, particularly the Boys and Girls Club is gonna be demolished and it's gonna be rebuilt and it's gonna take two years. And that's going to occur um, January um, 2021. So um, even though it's great for the area and for the Boys and Girls Club, um, unfortunately um, the, um, the campus school would not be able to use the gym there because it's not going to be in existence. So that's a good question. I see you, Ms. Oaks, but I have to give other members an opportunity to ask okay. questions. You know, Ms. Ms. Merchant had her chance. You certainly had your chance. Now Ms. Williams' chance. And then it will be Mr. Daniela's chance. Thank um, you. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Marrero, can you please address uh, Ms. Williams' concern about how the Boys and Girls Club, although a nice extension now, is uh, will not be there, let's say, in a year. So what, what considerations have you given to that? Sure, so I wanna say that uh, initially when I engaged the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club, there wasn't a set date, right? So it was open, as long as it's erect, you may use it. Uh, so thank you for letting us know that it's January. So it looks like this uh, fall semester will really be engaged in its usage. And then we're going to have to get creative during the cold months because uh, the park will not be available until the spring. So that is uh, the most immediate uh, plan now that we have that concrete. And then we really have to flush out something in terms of the entire academic year, the following year, and even the third year, if it takes that long for uh, a relocation to City Hall. But uh, for the launch, using the Boys and Girls Club as long as we can, and in the winter, taking the activities indoors, and then re-engaging with uh, the parks uh, come the spring in the summer. Um, I just wanna go back, and I, I, you still have the floor, Ms. Williams, but just to piggyback on that, just to flesh it out a little bit, when Ms. Um, Merchant was asking questions similar to this question, she mentioned free weights, she mentioned some gym um, equipment. Is, is that owned by the city school district? Will that be moved to campus school? And if not, could we procure some of that um, stuff to make sure that kids who are accustomed to having a semi-gym experience can, like, like gym experience can, um, can continue to, to have that within the Bethesda space? So I'll, I'll just say we'd have to find the, the equipment I believe is ours, but we'd have to find a space with which we work all of the offices and components to be able to bring that to. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a Nautilus machine. That's huge. That's for the football player. I mean, that's big. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, but uh, what I was thinking, Ms. Merchant, and, I, and obviously, you know, we have a master scheduler now in the high school who could certainly uh, probably facilitate the optimization of that space. But, you know, one of the areas that we looked at is that auxiliary room um, that is along the cafeteria. And it was kind of like a lost space. And even yesterday, there was like some conversations about what to do with that. But, uh, you know, that's a space that's a, that's a space where maybe we could, you know, we could think outside of the box. Um, I also think it's important to set expectations for everyone who are those who support this and those who don't support this, that the district is ve has been very clear all along with all of the stakeholders that the goal is to house our own students in our own facilities. Um, you know, once we have a better idea what we're doing with with the uh, city hall. So all of the questions that we're bringing up now, I would certainly hope would be handled totally differently with massive community input about what's gonna happen with the high school instructionally and uh, in terms of capital improvements. But a lot of the stuff that we're hearing is information that we're harnessing. And of course, uh, Ms. Schwab would know as well some of the things that have really worked for her student population to really make sure that we're building a, like Mr. Warhead would always say, a state of the art, a world-class environment teaching and learning environment that really captures all of the things that those students want. Mr. Daniello. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mr. Thurnow, Dr. Morero, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, you know, one of the things that sort of struck me was uh, the use of security. Um, and in looking at the presentation, you know, the transferring over the six cameras, uh, was there a, um, a survey done in regards to possible enhancements for security? Good question. Uh, I can address that as far as the facilities are concerned. We did look at the locations where we thought it appropriate to provide camera coverage. Uh, and we uh, uh, understood that the existing security staff that we currently utilize at campus would be relocated to uh, the Bethesda location. But regarding a specific survey, no, that I don't think that took place. We simply, with our architect and myself, identified those locations where with the installation of a camera, we could cover the areas that we believe necessary uh, to cover. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, in touring the facility yesterday, you know, I, I was very pleased as to what I had seen. And uh, I had seen, um, you know, in, in comparison to the facilities at St. St. Gabriel's Church, not to take away from the facility itself, but it's, it's far superior in, in, in appearance. Uh, the classrooms were small, but uh, can be delivered um, for the needs of the children. Uh, in an educational setting. Um, one of my biggest concerns, and, and I was the one that, that advocated for the board members to view the space, uh, was the partitions. And uh, in going into one of the classrooms, closing the partition, listening to everyone, trying to focus to listen to everyone on the other side of the partition, it was difficult for me to understand what was being said. I heard like muffled noises but I was focusing on that. If I'm engaged in a, in a class, um, I wouldn't. I, I, you wouldn't hear it. It'd be like chirping of birds in the background. Um, and, and, you know, I'm hearing, you know, table this tonight and push it off till next week. It's, it's not gonna change um, the overall outcome. Um, in, in, in looking at the space, um, and going through some of the comments that people had, had made, and I, I'm going to pose this question in regards to traffic at the beginning of school and at the end of the school day, it's during rush hour, and Lincoln Avenue is a, a, a highly traveled area. Um, will there be the assistance of NRPD like at the high school at dismissal to help with traffic flow, to help kids cross if they need to cross the street? Are we going to have those? I mean, they're they're older children. We don't necessarily need crossing guards, but to just like slow cars down because sometimes with traffic, when people see um, you know free road, they're a little heavy on the foot. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we going to uh, partner with NRPD to s assist 
the district in controlling traffic at those times. So we will certainly engage uh, Mr. Daniele to be able to um, give us some advice in okay. terms of the dismissal and how we dismiss and how we might be able to do that both as we've done in any school with our own security team, as well as you know engaging NRPD. And I would also say, um, if there's a need for an additional camera, if there's a need for an additional person at the end of the day, it's, we're very flexible to be able to do that and provide that. The camera is certainly no problem if we find that there's a blind spot or something uh, out in the um, exterior. And then, um, you know, looking at what we might need in terms of additional security or how we deploy the current security that we have to make sure that the morning and the afternoons are covered. Yeah, one of my things is, is, is very appealing to me is the increased access to programs at the high school. And that's ultimately where we want to get uh, the, the, the children. You want them to, to have the access to the AP classes and, and uh, we, we have to make the appropriate arrangements for you know, physical education as well. If we have to bus students to use the facilities at the high school, then, then that's what we have to do in inclement weather days. We have to make those arrangements. Um, we need more than just ping pong. That sort of okay. ir irritated me a little bit how ping pong was thrown out there. I get it. It's a little stimulating and difficult, eye-hand coordination, but they're, they're growing teenagers. They need a little bit more than just ping pong. Um, so, you know, th those are one of the things that I, I really would like, you know, the strategic thinking to go uh, in some of those avenues. Um, but in going back to what I had said, um, I, I am for, for the move. I, I, I see the, the benefit in it, uh, the accessibility uh, and being closer to the high school. So those are just my areas of concern. But uh, I hope the professionals that be um, will, will take that and try to correct those deficiencies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Warhead. Hey, thanks. Uh, it's always nice to hear from my colleagues on the Board of Ed, uh, and tonight is no exception. I would just like to remind everybody that Carl Thurnau is a nationally renowned expert in the area of facilities management. And, and he can speak for himself, but I understand that Carl has been saying for a while now that St. Gabriel's is really not up to snuff. And when Dr. Fejo came, she made it clear that she wanted to address the issue of uh, the campus school and to make sure that those students were receiving everything that they deserved. And uh, Mr. Thurnau, along with his team, worked with Dr. Fejo's administrative team, and they came up with Bethesda. They showed it to the board. It's clear that it's a better facility. And I love St. Gabriel's, it's lovely, but this is where we have to be. Now, the question of how we laid it out, as Ms. Mozelli said, was not great. But Anybody who's talking about uh, delaying the vote, it's to no purpose. And uh, the experts of the district have decided, what the board, we'll find out what the vote tonight, have recommended to the board that this move is a slam dunk. And they showed us in person and I am committed to it. And I definitely will be voting yes. Mr. Ainuzi. For Mr. Wong. Oh, since you've been director for the past year, what is the biggest concern that you have with the current facility? Did, 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 am I, did I, am I frozen? No, you're I good. Frozen. I heard oh. you. I'm myself. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Muting, unmuting. Okay. Um, so I wish I could say I've had like a long uh, standing relationship with this space. Um, we were put out the beginning of March. Um, and so I was there from September until then. And in this space, um, I think my greatest concern about the space um, was probably that it wasn't as 
bright and encouraging a space as the high school was. Um, I, having taught at the high school for 15 years prior to my appointment to this position, um, there was a bit of a disparity between the two, but um, so gloomy is not necessarily an inaccurate statement, but that was my biggest concern about this space overall. Ms. Wilkin, do you have any questions? You're muted, you're muted. And then Mr. Kern. Yeah. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure um, if uh, we were finished, I'm sorry. Um, if Will was done with his questions, because my, my uh, computer keeps going in and out, so I'm having trouble uh, following. So anyway, so I do have some questions um, and some comments. So um, the first comment I have is about something Dr. Marrero said that uh, about the ranch, <laughs> just going back to the ranch comment. Um, so it's not our own ranch because we, we will be leasing it from, from someone else. Uh, and so I just want to say that, you know, name that, that it's really not our own ranch um, at all. Um, and then the comment about the gold doors, um, you know, I've been hearing a lot of noise in the community about what's going to happen to City Hall. All, but the truth is, is that there's been absolutely no conversation mm -hmm. uh, at the board level about what happens um, at City Hall and whatever happens at City Hall is going to happen after there is an enormous amount, at least I believe, I'm not gonna be on the board probably when this happened, but an enormous amount of community engagement. So I think we have to be very careful about getting ahead of ourselves and saying, well, we're only gonna be here for a few years because we're gonna be at City Hall because no one has decided. I've heard there's gonna be an alternative school there. I've heard there's gonna be a ninth grade academy there. Nobody really knows. And so I think we need to be careful about making, making comments like, oh, don't worry, we'll be there in a few years. Um, so, a couple of specific questions about the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I appreciate that um, Dr. Marrero spoke to, I assume you spoke to LaTanya, um, yes. the executive director over there. Um, so I, I really appreciate that she was very open um, to us using the space, but my question is, um, have we had, uh, have we discussed specifically the times that we would wanna use it and whether or not uh, those times uh, are available for us to use um, and whether or not there would have to be an agreement between um, the school district and the Boys and Girls Club about that? Have we discussed that with them? So in terms of the agreement, uh, don't know if that's gone to that level in terms of any writ written agreement. In terms mm -hmm. of, from what I understand from the executive director, that during that time that we're in school, there wouldn't be any conflict. And if there were, we will work around it. It's really an empty, empty building, hence why we're gonna have the mm -hmm. escort. Uh, so it's going to be available uh, throughout the instructional day for us. I think the last steps are, as once we get the state approval and everything that Mr. Thurnow explained, we can definitely add that on to make sure in terms of like written, but the, the verbal uh, agreement or offer, I would say the, the welcoming uh, happened many months ago. Seems like um, okay. it's three months um, ago. I'm sure we would, um, and maybe I'm in the weeds, but I'm sure we would have to enter into some sort of agreement um, given liability issues that could come up. And that's the, the other question, or at least leads me to my next question, which is about the use of the park. Um, you know, it seems like a no brainer, we could just use the park, um, but I'm just wondering whether or not we spoke to the city about that um, and discussed whether or not we'd have to enter into an agreement with them. You know, I, I, I could guess there, there could be liability issues they, they could be concerned about, and we would have to work and iron those out or work out those issues ahead of time before we just went ahead and used the park. So have we spoken to the city about it? I, I have mentioned it to, uh, we have to work out the details of the timing and the scheduling, uh, but we could use the park uh, during the school day and we'd we, have to be we, escorted in sec with security. So you, you spoke to, you, okay. Um, so my next question. I, would, I, will, so I will say I will say that to Rachel's um, you know point. You know I know that you have regular uh, conversations with Mr. Strom, but I think that we have time so we can do it correctly. You know mm -hmm. I'm I'm very thankful that the city is willing to partner with us. I'm so thankful that the Boys and Girls is willing to partner with us. Absolutely. So we have time. So we you know we have a fabulous law firm that we pay. So I think we can you know take the time to engage 
Ingerman and make sure that all of these things are just properly ironed out between now and September so we don't find ourselves in a scenario where we want to do something and haven't thought it all the way through. So I think the initial conversations are great. The willingness on everyone's part to partner with us is great. But I do uh, agree with Ms. Relkin that at this point now, if the board proceeds, the very next step should be an, um, you know, bringing our attorneys on board to make sure it's buttoned up. Yeah, and there would have to be a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. And so this is where my, you know, my concern really lies is that uh, we haven't really ironed out a lot of these issues and we're making these broad statements like, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. But we really, really haven't ironed it out. Not that I think that it won't work out, but, you know, I personally think that these are things that we really need to button up before we say, okay, we're going to do it. Um, my question, I have, my next question is for Ms. Schwach. Um, I'm interested in what the kids right now, uh, what they do in the morning before school starts. Um, do they come early or do they go straight to their first period? No, you're muted, Ms. Schwach. I promise I'll get this by the end of the night, everybody. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so it depends on the kids. We have kids who are dropped off early. Um, some of them get rides from parents who leave for work early and so they take them on their way to work. So um, sometimes they'll eat breakfast. Sometimes a lot of them do play basketball in the gym as they wait for um, their peers to arrive. Um, some students do come and go straight to classes. Um, so it depends kind of on the kid and um, kind of what their morning looks like just personally. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm concerned about what what that's going to look like if we move to the new space. Um, not saying that I think that that it's an option for us to stay in field space. I'm just concerned about um, thinking these things through uh, before we actually go ahead and say this is the right space for us. What's going to happen to the kids in the morning when they get there? Is there adequate space for them to do uh, what we would want them to be able to do? Um, and let's see. So I wrote down a couple of questions then. So I guess uh, the natural question I have, I, or it's natural for me to ask this question, I think after that question is, is have we, um, and Dr. Dr. Fejo, this is for you. So we didn't, I just wanna make sure I understand, um, we didn't engage the students at all about what they'd like to see in a space, right? Uh no, but I think that that is something we want to do. I mean, I think to the point about the ping pong where we might have thought it was exciting or opportunities for uh, students to come in. I think we'd want to engage them in what kind of activities they'd want to have available to them and how we can do that. And so we haven't engaged them, but we've thought through a lot of different options that we're not. Um, we thought through using the park. We've thought about how we're going to use the spaces that are in there and some of the options, but engaging the students in which ones would be best for them is um, would be a next step. I will say that when I went to campus school to talk to them about lunch, I don't know if you remember very well. I remember, one. sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. So I went to every class, I had an opportunity to speak to kids and uh, they are they were incredibly creative about things that they wanted to see, ways that we can do lunch, uh, things that they were interested in. And some of the things they wanted during those conversations were more ways to get together and be together in the cafeteria. Now, I know I was talking specifically about lunch at that time, but engaging them and providing them with games or things that they could have opportunities to engage in, because as Ms. Schwach said, not everybody's in the gym. Uh, a lot of kids wanted to be with the teachers in the classrooms, and we sort of were trying to figure out how to engage both in the cafeteria kind of space as well as in the classrooms. And so they had creative ideas that we could certainly implement and that we know about, but we can engage them again in this space about opportunities that they have and um, for both at lunch, before and after school, uh, uh, in the school. Okay. Um... Going back to the amount of space available in the classrooms, um, uh, Mr. Thurnow, I, I heard you say, and I have no reason to doubt you, of course, that the space is adequate for 15 to 17 students, I think you said, is that right? Correct. Right. Um, so when we were in the space yesterday, and I really appreciate the tour, I, I felt like we absolutely needed to see the space before um, we voted and, um, and 
quite frankly, I um, was very skeptical about the space before we went in, and um, I was pleasantly surprised about the space. It was not what I expected when we went in, and um, I, I appreciate you being there and, and kind of walking us through what each of the rooms would look like and um, what the plans were ultimately. Um, but the 15 to 17 kids in those classrooms, the classrooms when, that we were in, um, not the art one, but the one, I guess you would say, when you walked in, they would have been on the far, um, the far wall, the ones where they were gonna put the partitions in, they seemed right. really, is that where we're saying we would put 15 to 17 students? Because they right. seem really small for that. Yes, uh, but um, <clears throat> the, the capacity of a typical classroom uh, from the state education point, state, right. uh -huh. state education department standpoint, of course, it's only 770 square feet, and they allow 27 kids in a space of that size, and that's okay. the standard that the state uses statewide. So, uh, proportionally, yes, that's exactly what that space is designed to handle. And again, the code allows uh, uh, it's a ridiculous, right. but 180 people to exit through that classroom door in an emergency situation. Yes. Um, so yes, I believe the space can adequately handle that number of people. Okay. Um, and so I'm, I, just to be clear, I'm not questioning whether or not um, it could adequately handle that number of people. It's certainly not my place to question um, what the, you know, what the regs say. Um, but just from a, you know, personal perspective of walking to the classroom, for me, it just felt tight. So that's why I was, you know, asking whether or not, um, we were talking about 15 to 17 people in, in that space. Uh, let's see. So my other question, I just want to make sure I get all of them. Um, so Dr. Feho, I asked you before about the engagement of the students, and um, you said that you engage them on um, the lunch situation, but not on uh, specifically about the move. And um, I, my understanding is that you had uh, discussions with teachers um, recently, but they were not engaged before. Is that right? I had a meeting with some members of uh, FUSE uh, to discuss, including one of the teachers there and some other people, to discuss the move and answer any questions that they had. And as you know, yesterday, um, a couple of them joined after the board visit to walk through the space. Um, Okay, but it was, I just want to be clear, right? So, but it wasn't before, right? It wasn't before, it was after you decided you were going to make the recommendation to the Yeah, to the I mean, board. part of the recommendation is happening during uh, a time when we're not in school. Um, while we started talking about it early on, yes. Uh, well, we started talking about it early on. We did leave school in March. And um, I did have a recent conversation with members of the teaching staff as well as the visit, but not prior to that. Okay, and just to close but the I loop, do, we... I do, uh, I just want to mention that I know Director Swack was, there were questions that came up before and there were conversations at the school about the potential move. Okay, and, and just to close the loop on this question, because it, it's come up a couple of times, um, there was no engagement, right, um, with parents about this at all. No, the right. thinking was that we would do it later on after we were more secure with moving forward with this. Um, and that, uh, but now that there would be an opportunity to do that. So I will make sure I meet with families and give them an opportunity to talk about the, the option at, um, at the new location. So I wanna um, circle back to something that um, Ms. Mazzelli said which was, um, and I, I'm not quoting you, Ms. Mazzelli, but essentially that um, we would have to start the healing process after the vote. And I just wanna throw out there, um, Dr. Feho, uh, and you don't have to answer this, it's really a rhetorical question. You know, How many times we have to start a healing process after a decision's been made because we didn't engage people before we made the decision? Um, it's, it's very frustrating <laughs> to be put in this position and um, I don't appreciate it. Uh, at all. Um, and so the final thing I want to just throw out there is um, how we use space, I think, um, you know, sends a powerful message about values, right? And so the fact that um, I, I certainly understand that there can be mixed use spaces places, but um, I think we're sending a message 
by accepting a space that doesn't have certain things. Um, and I would just leave you with this, that I would ask you whether or not you would think other, other communities within our New Rochelle community would accept that, that they would find it acceptable to have a school space without a gym area or without a well, I essentially a gym. So I, I, I just don't, I don't think they would. So that's my final comment. Rachel, your, yes. your, your student goes to, to went to um, Davis School. Correct. The size of those classrooms, huge. Well, I think they also added on a, a, I mean, I was not on the board when this happened and I don't think you were either, Leanne, but yeah. I believe a, a, a gym was added on to Davis School many years ago. It's just this little classroom space, huge. And that's elementary school. So I, I would just, wanna, I just wanna, I wanna just uh, share, just have a direct conversation with my colleague, Ms. Relkin, about, you know, positioning Bethesda as such a low bar that you don't believe that people would accept it for their children. I, I don't agree with that whatsoever. I would. Uh, if my child was in the alternative campus school, I would absolutely be very happy to send him there. I think it's a very welcoming and nurturing place. I guess there must be some sort of bias when it comes to Lincoln Avenue that I don't have because I live a few yards from there on Lincoln. Um, and I, I really, I really cannot get behind this narrative that other communities would be somehow disheartened or put off by by that location. I think that look for me, that location is the heart of the city. And in I terms of in terms of having um, a gym situation, uh, Mr. Thurnow shared with us that for the better part of the year, the gym was not really operational at St. Gabe's because it buckled because of a, some sort of plumbing failure. Moreover, we've heard that St. Gabe's was closed multiple times. So I really do think that making frozen ensure that our schools are not closed because of mechanical problems trumps not having a gym. And I, I also think that for whatever reason, uh, we're being very selective about what we're hearing because the administration has made every commitment to make sure that students who want to engage in um, courses in the high school, which include gym, will be taken there, periods one through eight. So it's not a situation where kids are going to have some sort of reduced experience. Quite the contrary, they're going to have what has been described as an intimate setting which suits their needs along with the full menu and option of courses that exists at a uh, high school. And when you're looking at a high school of 3,600 kids, of course, the course experience is rich, much richer than some college campuses even, in terms of the quantity and diversity of the classroom, class um, experiences, which simply cannot be um, provided in a class of, in a school of just 80 kids. So when they were at, at St. Gabe's and they only had access to the few classes that they taught there, they had a very limited exposure in terms of um, education and the kinds of classes they could have access to. So I just wanted to push back on that because I found it a little bit offensive, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> not once, I just wanna, not once did I say that I had a problem with the location itself. And I, 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 I am a little offended by the fact that you're suggesting that I was saying that I have a problem with the location, that, that where it is is the problem and it's not at all the issue I'm raising, not at all. And um, I don't well, actually, I'm sorry, next is uh, Mr. Warhead and then Mr. Kern. Uh, I think this, this conversation is fascinating. Um, I wanna say two things. St. Gabriel's is not an option. We can't be there. We're gonna be somewhere. And Mr. Thurnow presented us a great option in Bethesda. And the other thing which I want to say directly to my colleagues, you might like it, you might not. You should, I would hope that you'd be more focused on doing what's right for the students. And that is moving campus school to Bethesda and being less interested in emails that you're getting from members of the community. You ask everybody in the community, half will say this, half will say that. And you know what? The community doesn't decide. The Board of Education decides. So put on your big boy pants and get ready to make a decision and live with it. <laughs> Mr. Kern, and then I'll see Ms. Merchant, and then I'll see Ms. Williams, and then I'll see Ms. Oaks. Um, 
Thank you. Wow. Um, so much has been said uh, by so many. I'm going to just try and be brief, but I want to I want to share how I think about this. Um, I think let's start off by acknowledging that you know th th there th this this is a hard one. This is not a good example of uh, well planned public discourse around a tricky topic. Um, so let's 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 acknowledge that. Um, what what I am hearing so it, but, but like sort of the, the way I'm making sense of this this decision point, and I'm I'm disappointed and frustrated that my schedule didn't allow me to join last evening, but I feel like I got a good report on from from those of you who did did go. I think that it has been a clear and consistent message that we've been receiving from Mr. Thurnau about the inadequacies of the current um, location at St. Gabe's. Uh, I have a ton of trust in your expertise, Mr. Thurnau, so I'm placing a lot of weight in that. Um, so in that sense, I, I, I do feel a sense of urgency to, to address that situation. Um, then I, I feel like I, I'm separating the outcome or the decision from a location, you know, physical plant perspective from the process. Mm -hmm. um, based on everything that I'm hearing, while I'm not sure I would go so far as to say slam dunk, because I think there are some real trade-offs here, but on, on balance, I, I feel like what I'm hearing is that, that the Bethesda location is, is better on whole, or it feels net positive to me um, from, a, from an outcome for, for students and some of the flexibilities and the things that we gain, I think clearly we lose some things that are important to us and to the, to the families and the staff and the community. And I think that's, I mean, that, that's any hard choice. There are trade-offs. But I come down on the side of net positive, uh, maybe on the, on, the, on the move itself. Um, most of the frustration, I've heard little, I mean, not, not, not nothing, but most of what I feel like I'm hearing from from my colleagues here are frustrations on the process. And I think that is very well founded. I think this is process matters. Um, I echo the comments of so many of my colleagues that this is like, we're spending all this time on the frustrations around the process. And sometimes it's unavoidable. In this case, it doesn't seem like it was unavoidable. Um, I also feel like uh, at this moment, delaying the decision would have some downsides and no real upsides because I think what what the community deserves deserved was more authentic engagement and I think that that is not possible as quickly as would need to be true and that we just cannot this cannot keep happening um, and then the last thing I, I want to say on this is um, one of the things that I personally found most compelling about the move which has been raised a number of times is the physical proximity and the potential to align the schedules and open up additional opportunities. So I really appreciated Ms. Merchant's push on this front. So if we're saying that, and I know that we have gone on record multiple times about the, the discrepancy around access and uh, to, to not just AP, but a, a range of courses, we are very committed as a board to making progress on that front. So if we're gonna name that, if we, if we move forward, and I would support the move despite all of my misgivings around process. Um, I want to underscore those concerns that, that Leanne was raising and saying, if we're gonna go through with this, we gotta, we gotta follow through and make sure that we're making good on some of those benefits um, so, that they're, so that they're made available to students that wouldn't otherwise have them that, that might under the current situation. That's all I have. Thank you. I know that I need to see Ms. Merchant, Ms. Williams, and Ms. Oaks. I'm hoping that I remember the order correctly, but we'll go with that. Ms. Merchant, Ms. Williams, Ms. Oaks. Okay. Um, it just, to me, it feels like we, you know, Lincoln Avenue, the church is wonderful. Reverend Weaver is wonderful. But for an educational structure, would I send my, this is a question, would you send your children to be educated in the church is the question. And I am asking myself, to me, it seems like a containment school. Like we've got the kids contained. It's where is the 
uplifting enchant. This is an enchanted experience and this is transformational and inspirational and all the great things we want for our kids. Since when, to me, it feels like they're getting less than. Since when, to me, the kids at risk get less than. It doesn't seem at on par, even though St. Gabe's is horrible, the things that are missing are integral things that they need to function and need to live. This cannot be. And so when, when Ms. Mazzelli says there are no other alternatives, didn't anybody bother to call the, the you know, the college, the people that own the college in New the, the, the Masons, and they're not doing anything with their facility, they just acquired it in December. Like there are, there are alternatives. And it shouldn't be such a push to get the, to ram the decision down our throats so quickly without us even, we just barely saw the place yesterday. And then we just barely got the, the, the documents online uh, before the meeting. And here we are, so we're the board and then the people in the community are like trying to get their, have their say and have, and it's teachers and, and not to have gone out to the students. <laughs> These are almost adults and we haven't engaged with them to find out what they need to feel important, to feel like we care, this is inadequate to me. And, um, you know, God bless Bethesda and, and Reverend Weaver and all that they're trying to do, but these students are at risk and they need more than, they don't need less than in this temporary situation, it's gonna be three years and two year extension. That's three to five years, this is not acceptable. I wouldn't send my kid there to be educated. Yes, he can go there for the, MLK breakfast and go to church and all that kind of stuff, but to be educated, no. And I ask any of you on the board with children and ch school age children, would you send their, your kids there in September? I would, I said that, I would. I absolutely would. For an education. Yes, for an education, absolutely. Because the education okay. is founded on the teachers, the teachers who educate the students. Absolutely. So as long as we have, you asked the questions, so I'll answer. As long as we have a clean and safe environment and we have, good teachers who are dedicated to the students, which we do have. And, um, you know, I would probably be more inclined to send my child to the alternative campus school now that there are actual viable options for a larger diversified educational experience. I think one of the reasons I would have always been reluctant to send my child to that school, even if it were a better setting for him was because of how, how limited the choices ever were. The questions I asked every time we went to um, Bethesda, um, to St. Gabe's and we sat in that auditorium. Um, every time I said, and what have you done to make sure that the students have access to AP level classes? You know, you talk about how these kids are going to SUNY, you talk about how these kids are going to, um, some of the kids are going to great universities. I mean, they're not limited cognitively, they just need to be in a more intimate setting. So what have you done to challenge them? The answer every year was nothing. They're a small cohort. We're not sure they'd be interested. There was not a growth mindset there. There was not an investment in those kids to make sure that they had access to all of the wonderful things that we cherish in the high school. And the ability to have the students place closer to the high school absolutely makes it a location that I would send my child. And I think that that is a safe place and a clean place. And in terms of the education, the, the, the chairs and the walls don't teach, it's the teachers that teach. The facility is not on par with the, with the high school and, and it just, you know, and the offerings are just not there, so. You can send your child there if you'd like, and that's fine, but I'm just an open, honest question to the people on the board, like, you know, seriously, if I wouldn't send my kid there to be educated, I, you know, I, I'm pushing back on this, and we have other options, and maybe somebody should call over to the College um, of New Rochelle and see what's going on there, because that's a campus, and it's a campus school, maybe that could be something uplifting for the, for the students. Um, Ms. Williams, then Ms. Inuzi. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you, and I'm really grateful that we're having this opportunity to have this robust um, discussion. And um, it would have been helpful to have this, you know, a few months ago. Um, but it is what it is. Um, but I just want to caution us. Um, you know, um, things are charged. We can see that, and we're responding to um, what we're hearing from the community, and also what we've seen in our own eyes, and what we would expect for our own children. So those are some things. So I think we have to be careful in saying that a person is um, biased or not biased against Lincoln Avenue or any place. Um, I think that, you know, uh, what we all shared um, is valid. 
And it's not that we're trying to be against any institution or any people. Um, we should just stick with what we're actually saying. Um, so, um, and um, I heard a colleague say that, you know, um, um, we just have to vote. Well, yeah, we just have to vote. And then based on that, we'll see what happens. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Oaks. Dr. Fejo, I want to say that um, I don't hold you fully responsible for this because I think you were really uh, not well advised by board leadership at all in this process. Um, so I have a question because it was never answered in my emails. How, physically, how many locations did you visit? for this move because I don't know about everybody else, but like when I was renting an apartment and when I was like buying my house, I saw a lot of different properties. So I would like to know, cause it was never answered, how physically, how many places were visited? So I did not go and actually visit another site. When we started talking about this uh, very early on, we had plenty of conversations and Carl's here, Mr. Kern, Greg Kern is not here about possibilities, the possibility of what might happen. Uh, and I'm not alluding to what might happen down the road. If there were classrooms available here to be able to do something like this, what properties might be available locally. From the time that I went to St. Gabe's, it was very clear that it is unacceptable space for a lot of reasons. I saw myself things that, you know, I've mentioned before that were just unacceptable in terms of safety. And so we talked about a lot of spaces and places along North Avenue. I did not actually go and visit any of them. This opportunity came up when I was there and I saw the space for, I forget which breakfast, and um, thought of having it, it was so close to here and so close to the high school that it was an amazing opportunity, really just a great space. So there wasn't a whole bunch of places that we went to. Um, in fact, the reason why we have a couple of room downstairs is around the conversations that stemmed from, is it possible, could we find the number of classrooms? And initially we were talking about 10 classrooms. Could we call up 10 classrooms to do something here? Would that be possible? With some of the other locations, could we get a space right around either City Hall or close to the high school? And um, that's how this ended up transpiring. And it was a beautiful space. It's a great opportunity to be close by both places. And it started the conversation there. Unfortunately, for a lot of things that could have been better done, and I'm not saying that there wasn't opportunities that were missed in this process. So I'm not negating um, some of the comments that were made, but in light of the COVID-19 and the change and everything that was happening, um, I would say that that limited the amount of time we had to do some of this, although I will not excuse it. I will just say that that was uh, part of the timing and part of the block of time that we had from November 1st to now. I just have one last question. Um, I know that the feeling was to align the bell schedule so that kids could uh, utilize classes at the high school. Uh, given the fact that there's only a four minute window between classes yeah. and we've already been cited for our minutes, making our minutes, how are kids going to make sure. all the minutes that they need if they're trying to take an AP class or doing gym at the high school? Sure. So I will start by saying that when uh, I came and we started looking at it and, and Director Schwach looked at the minutes, there were still issues, I've said this publicly, with the amount of minutes that we had per class in order to make seat time. And so what was possible from February 1st was to make up the amount of time that may have been lost. 
and, and Director Schwach was very creative about figuring out how we can do that and making sure the number of minutes calculated in the second semester were appropriate. And the alignment to the high school is just to do that, to ensure that the same thing we're saying, the program follows that so that the same experience students are getting in terms of minutes and number of classes uh, dramatically expands by following the model that the high school follows, not only in terms of minutes, but in terms of the cycle. And so while four minutes, it was clearly said, is not possible, there is, when you have individual programming, the ability to move around certain periods. So you could move around a lunch period or a free period or move the time around to be able to accommodate the minutes when our priorities are in the right order. And that is to give the students the richest experience possible. So if it was a very exciting and appropriate for a student to take a class they couldn't take at the campus site, we would figure it out. We could move the lunch period. We could move some other things and figure out how a student could get the credits. We get students in this program that are sometimes behind in credits and they are going to night school as was mentioned or after school to get credits. And so if this provides an opportunity, there's flexibilities there to be able to provide that opportunity. And I just wanna say this, and I think it's been said before, this is not a kind of student. This is not a category of student. This is a lot of different kinds of differently abled and, and different needs of students where a parent would operationalize and opt in to going to this location. And it should really feel in all ways possible that they have access to the kind of course catalog that the high school has, either in some cases by bringing it to the site, but now in this case, by being able to access the high school. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Mr. So, so Dr. Sayo and, and uh, Mr. Turnham, can you give us... Sorry, Mr. Ainuzi, it's hard to hear you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I'm sorry. Something's wrong with my laptop. Um, uh, Dr. Sayo and Mr. Thurnow, so theoretically, what would happen if Bethesda is not the pick? What's the next apologize. step? What happens? What's the process? I apologize. What was the last word? If Bethesda was not what? If it was not picked, what's the what's the alternatives? What's the process? What happens next? Well, um, if Bethesda was not picked at this time, we would have to go back and confirm that we would stay at campus for uh, another year at least. Um, and then uh, additionally, uh, we would have to begin searches for other locations. Uh, I would mention that we did check with uh, the other Catholic schools, for example, uh, Holy Family was used during the Webster ceiling collapse. That was before my arrival, but that facility is occupied. Um, the uh, Blessed Sacrament High School is also currently occupied, so those spaces were not available. Um, but uh, there would have to be a return to campus for at least uh, a year and then a, a search for additional potential locations. And Given that the location is unsatisfactory, there would have to be investments in uh, ensuring that there are things that happens that, I mean, I think you said if we were going to stay there uh, in order to meet compliance, there would be a significant investment that would have to be made to be able to do that. Correct. The building condition survey said over $2 million and uh, the term of the lease would need to be long enough such that the improvements that were made accrued to the district as opposed to just the private owner. Can you can you flesh that out for us, Mr. Um, Thurnow? I apologize, could you say that can again? Can you just flesh that out, Mr. Thurnow, for people who aren't aware of exactly what you mean by that? You know, yes, people a, using public, public funds and a public private property. Yes, a public entity such as the school district, when uh, leasing private property, there are laws in, uh, revolving around um, the limitations on public monies that we can spend on private properties. So if there was a need to spend significant dollars, such as the $2 million identified in the building condition survey at campus, we would need to engage in a lease of sufficient term that the life of the improvements that we would make the lease would be as long as the, the term of the life improvements. So in other words, if we made 15 year investment by making uh, uh, renovations to campus, the state education department 
amortizes those improvements over 15, 20, or 30 years. 15 years for renovations, 20 years for additions, and 30 years for new facilities. So if we were able to uh, improve campus with renovations, the term of our lease would need to be 15 years in order to accrue the benefits of the improvements that we were making to that facility. Also, you would probably, you would need voter approval on all of that. That is correct. So the, the voters would have to say okay to all of that. That is correct. So, so basically the options in front of us right now are voting for Bethesda or if it gets voted down, then we have to stay at St. Gabe's for multiple years in order for the improvements to be paid for. If, the public if you made improvements, you would have to, you would have to certainly negotiate a new lease for the coming year. But then if there were a decision to make improvements, then depending on the magnitude of those improvements would depend the future uh, length of the lease. And the board would be entering into a lease knowing that there are serious liabilities that we were privy to in executive session about, about St. Gabe's. I mean, we were told information in executive session that really makes St. Gabe's not an option. I mean, we continue to talk about it like it's an option, but we were told not an option. unequivocally why it's not an option. Ms. Williams. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, will we be able to extend the lease um, so that we have, um, like, at least for a month, just so that we have um, time to look at other options? Because, you know, this is a big city of 88,000 people or somewhere around there. Um, so um, like, I definitely don't know of any spaces, but somebody knows. So, I mean, I think we should look at other spaces because that's like one thing that um, I'm having a problem with. It's like, I'm only shown one place and then I'm not really supposed to question it because the person who gives me the place is an expert. So I'm not supposed to question. Um, I, I, that's not fair to me and um, that's not fair to any of our colleagues either because you know part of the reason why you become a board member is because you ask the questions so I think we need more information. I think that's a good question. Mr. Thurnow can you um, tell the board what the timeline would be if we were to try and look for another place would it even be possible to get all of the stuff done architecture drawings submissions lease contracts everything sent to SCD by September? In my opinion, it's not possible to secure a different location and start the process all over again and hope to occupy in September. Ms. Merchant. Uh, someone texted me that Holy Name is available, but I'm not necessarily recommending that, but it's empty and available. It's just that we should look, we should have looked at things that are available. And College of Nourishell is certainly available. I think that that's a good point. I think definitely multiple sites should have been surveyed and canvassed and op multiple options should have been brought to the board. But I also think that what Mr. Thurnow said a minute ago, which is that even if we had six or seven options, they wouldn't be viable to get that done by September. But wouldn't we prioritize? It's not like we're gonna invest $2 million in capital improvement in a, in a facility we don't own. We would phase it in. And maybe yeah. in a year's time or six months time, we would have had to have spent X amount of dollars, not 2 million to get us you know, at the level where we need to be to have the kids safe. And we t as we take our time looking at some of the other options. So I just wanna remind everybody, we've been talking about this and to Mr. Thurnow's point, we've been talking about the location for a, a while now. And this has taken a long time to arrive at this point. This, is, this wasn't a, a, you know, we had explored and talked about while we didn't visit other sites. Uh, this is something that's been a while in the making. Suppose we're remote in September. We're gonna so invest- we're, to, to Dr. Marrero's point, if we're remote in September, whatever rules the, are applied in terms of what we do at the high school will be the same here, the same social distancing. But so we wouldn't have to invest $2 million in a capital improvement plan if we're remote. Are you suggesting we should plan on being remote? Don't we have to have a facility? It's a possibility where you're saying we definitely have to invest $2 million. I, I think they're all, we could look at that a little bit differently. Maybe there's a phased, there's- oh, please. Right. 
Uh, okay. Listen, I, you know, I, was, I think what we, I think what we'll do now is we're going to go to the next topic on the agenda. We can all think about this, and then uh, we'll, you know, we'll consider where we want to go from here. So I'm pivoting now Great. to the next topic on the agenda. I appreciate everyone's uh, input, and uh, I just think potentially, even while other presentations are going on, we can think about what our what our next steps are. And what I'll put out there to the board is that we had um, Ms. Williams talk about potentially postponing the vote. I know that there are other people who had uh, thought about that. That's an option, so we'll leave, leave it on the table. And we had other members of the board say, including me, that although it, the concept of postponing the vote conceptually makes so much sense, the outcome, it's unfortunately, we're in a situation where we were not provided options and the postponement doesn't change the outcome. And so I just want people to think about it. I think we've all been really open and honest about what our supporting uh, positions are, what our concerning uh, situations are. The one thing I just hope doesn't get lost in all of this is the tremendous amount of work that Mr. Thurnau did. So either way, Mr. Thurnau, I mean, the board is indebted to your service and to your commitment and to your expertise. And um, I know that no matter how long I'm around in this uh, ed space, I'm never gonna know 100th of what you know. And so I really appreciate what you've done. And um, Dr. Feho, I do wanna say that I know that you've been committed to campus school since you've got here. I know that it was your intention to make this a positive thing. I hope that you walk away with some uh, lessons learned in terms of like really how, when you're in a community like New Rochelle and you're not in, 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 in New York City, how engaging with the board and engaging with the community is, is, is everything, is everything. Because what otherwise would have been really a simple conversation because people would have been vested and had come along and we would have at least landed somewhere where everyone was comfortable because we would have vested, you know, vetted options and whatever. And Mr. Thurnau wouldn't have dedicated six months of his life in something that some members of the, the board don't don't like. That none, none of that would happen. So I'm going to put a pin in it. I want to thank you for your commitment to campus school, um, Ms. Schwab. I've heard so many wonderful things about you. Honestly, Dr. Feo talks about you uh, very very positively. And I know that you were advocating for some really important things at campus school early on. It was you that brought to Dr. Fejo's attention, some very serious, significant um, problems with the way that uh, the students were including seat time and including labs, a lot of things you brought to the superintendent's attention day one. I mean, it was really her first day on the job and you were already flagging these things and it just speaks to your commitment to the students. Um, so I really wanna thank you for that as well. Uh, Dr. Morrow, I don't mean to leave you out. Um, we, we appreciate everything that you do as well. And Mr. Reed, you don't have anything to do with this, so you get a free pass. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. At this time, sorry, I'm pleased to open the floor to comments from members of the public. The board sets aside time in our regular meetings for public comment because we wanna hear from you. I'm so sorry, I'm having a difficult evening. We have some simple rules for our agenda. First, when you come to speak at the microphone, please say your name and address and the name of any organization of speaking in a representative capacity. Second, please note that individuals are not permitted to cede their time, and please limit your uh, remarks to three minutes if you signed in advance. There's a number of people who did sign up in advance, and you'll have your three minutes. Otherwise, it'll be two minutes. Um, and of course, the district's work is education, so please uh, be cognizant of that. So I think what happened in the past is I was holding up a timer. I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, thank you, Ms. Osa. I got the resolution. Thank you. I'm gonna do my best to do that, but if for whatever reason my arm gives out or something, I might, uh, I might quit and ask for another board member to, to volunteer. Okay, so the first, so we have five people who signed up in advance and they will get three minutes. Um, and then we're gonna do the people who signed up in advance who will get two minutes. And then we're gonna go to the list that's being um, managed by Mr. Warhead. So first is Mr. Sanchez. I, I hope he's still here. I'm going to be looking for him. One moment. This is going to take a little while. I'm sorry, everybody, because there's a lot. Of, okay, I found him. Mr. Sanchez, uh, you're muted. Am I okay now? Yes, you are okay now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> thank you for showing me the clock. 
Well, um, I don't know if you don't like that, I can stop and start the clock over. Okay. Uh, I'll start it over. Anyway. But, um, I'd like to thank the uh, members of the board who um, uh, raised a number of questions regarding the alternative high school. Uh, I appreciate very much your perspectives and your uh, concern about the uh, enormous lack of transparency that has occurred over the last many months. Um, and so I just wanted to raise that issue uh, at length. Um, there seems to be a lack of transparency, particularly on the issue of safety, because the only concern that the principal had was that the school was gloomy. Um, gloomy is not a good reason to move sometimes, but uh, it is what it is. Um, several months ago, on behalf of Fuerza Latina, uh, our membership, and on behalf of the parents of the Alternative High School, over a month ago, requested a, a meeting with um, Dr. Fejo uh, to speak about this issue uh, of the Alternative High School. We never received any response. Um, we had some legitimate concerns um, and goes to the issue of lack of transparency and all the issues of not involving the community on this issue and also many other issues. Um, the telling number here is that 92% of the students, 80 students at the alternative high school are students of color. And obviously they have um, parents who are also people of color. It is very telling that the um, leadership of the Board of Ed is not considering their perspective, their opinion before all this stuff happened. Um, it's very rather shocking and amazing. Um, it doesn't include the students. Uh, it didn't include the teachers um, at any point. Um, I think what the best suggestion would be to table this and let's live with St. Gabriel's for one year, get what you need to do in terms of safety. There's no $15 million that we have to allocate over the next six months or a year. That's not true, um, but we can fix things that are necessary. So I think the best option is to table this for one year and hopefully um, engage the community instead of uh, engaging them afterwards. It's like beating somebody up and then asking them questions. Um, it is very uh, disrespectful to our communities of color. It's very telling um, of the leadership and I would hope that we do better. I think a number of members of the board have expressed their concern. I would hope that the, we act upon those issues uh, tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next is Mr. Gordon Highland. Okay. Hi, Mr. Highland. Hello. Yeah, so I have um, some comments to make. Um, I don't think I like the process very much. I don't like the way things keep happening to us. And I, I really have to keep going back to how things are sprung on our community. It's disrespectful. And I'm really tired of hearing, oh, we should just, we should just, you know, things will be better in the future. These are things Martin Luther King talked about in his letter from the Birmingham jail that he didn't know who was worse, the Ku Klux Klanner or the white moderate who says, hold on, your time is coming. Just wait, just wait on the Lord. And I'm really tired of all of the disrespect, all of the finding out things at the last minute. Like the last speaker said, 92% of the people who, who will be at that school are people of color. And, you know, I've heard people say that they have families of color and, you know, I, I've, I've heard quite a lot, but this is not the way your family is treated and this is not the way my family is treated. It's a, it's a very open secret that for years, the children who were sent to the campus school were the ones they wanted to get rid of out of the high school. So if hopefully that's going to change with these so-called AP courses, I'd, I'd like to see that actually happen. I'd like to see the upstairs downstairs system destroyed entirely, um, which everybody, you know, who with any time around here, you know, knows. Um, so I think it's a good thing that the school go to Bethesda. I just don't like your process. It was disgusting. And I'm just tired uh, of the way things are done around here to my people. And I'm going to speak on it. And I don't care who likes it. But I think that the space at Bethesda is warm and inviting. It's clean. 
It's closer to the neighborhood that many of the students come from. Um, it has a better proximity to the high school. And, and here's one thing that, that I find interesting. Many of the naysayers who, who are naysayers because of the location, many of those naysayers never uttered a peep when students were in the same building as homeless people, as people who were mentally ill and chemically addicted, um, convicts, people who just got out of prison. If you go to St. Gabe's and you pass the door where you go into the campus school and you walk down the long pathway and you go in the, the first door you come to and you go down those three stairs and you make a right and you walk down that corridor past Hope Community Services for the homeless. And then you walk up the stairs, you're in the campus school. The door is unlocked and you have people who are pedophiles, known convicts and rapists, and nobody uttered a peep when the children of color had to go to school in this dilapidated building surrounded- I'm sorry, Mr. Highland. I'm sorry, Mr. Highland. Um, I'm sorry, Who Mr. are housed in that building. Thank you, Mr. Highland. Thank you for your comments. Amy, while we're transitioning, can I offer to take over the time timekeeping for you? Sure. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next is Miss <clears throat> Reby. She'll have three minutes as well. If somebody could check with me whether you think you she's on here or not. Because I don't. I don't believe she's on here. I'll look by last name. I, was I think she said that she would speak the next time. Okay. I think she she posted and said, you know what, next okay. time. Well, we'll keep her three minutes. Um, if she shows up, I'll, I'll honor the three minutes. Um, Miss Herbert is next. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, hi, Ms. Herbert, you are uh, muted, but you'll have three minutes. Good welcome. evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. I mean, you can. Um, I, I just have to say that I'm so disappointed by, once again, by this board, and, and not all of you, I will say, Julia, I have to clap my hands to you for really standing up for what's right. Once again, the community was not involved in something that's so vital to our students and, and it's shameful. This has been talked about for a while, but never once did you talk to the children about it to see you know, what works for them, what they would like. Never once did you talk to the staff to see what they would like. And never once did you talk to the community to see what would work for them. While people have been asking for a school in the Lincoln corridor, this is Bethesda is not the place for it. It doesn't have the facilities that these children need. It doesn't have, um, is there a place for nurses offices? Are there private offices for counseling supports? You know, what resources are there? Where are the children going when they want to go out to lunch and they want air and they want to get the sun? There's no space on Lincoln Avenue for that. It's, I would not send my, my child to the school there. I have no, no problem with the Lincoln Avenue corridor in general. It's the facility. It's not a school. Um, it's, it's just absolutely insane that you would want to do this. And you know, one of the things that they did back in 1961 when there was Taylor versus the Board of Education is that they they said that the schools were not equal. You're not providing the, the equal education, equal facilities. And to say that there's no gym is shameful. To say that they can go to the park, a public park, unacceptable. To say that they can use the board of, they can use the, Boys Club, which is going to be torn down in January, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're not, you're not looking at the community. Once again, you're doing what you want and you're not listening to the community. And then the, in this school, the, 
these children are going there by choice. They are applying, they are interviewing, and they have to convince the staff that this is where they wanna be. Listen to those students, listen to the teachers, do not listen to yourself. And Paul Warhick, you ought to be ashamed of yourself to sit there and say that the community doesn't have a say, that you're the Board of Education. You are representing the community. You ought to step down. It's time for you to go. You are shameful. So could I just address the space issue or? Well, uh, Ms. Herbert, your time is up, but um, it seems that uh, the superintendent wants to respond to you. So I'll let her do that, of course. It's just in terms of the space. There were uh, considerations made in terms of the students couldn't go out from the second day, you know, there's a closed campus. There was no outside space at St. Gabe's. There was no kitchen. There was no cafeteria space. I think we discussed all of the safety concerns from the time I got there. Students were eating on steps and you know there were adults climbing over them. This is the opportunity to have better daily classroom, cleaner space where students can be in during the day for classes. And while we're making accommodations and we thought through some ways to have physical education and provide opportunities for students. Yes, we should engage them in the process of what they want to have versus what we may be thinking they want to have. But in speaking with them previously about their classroom space and how they would have lunch, they are creative and they will come up with ways. But there's so many more opportunities here at this site than had been available at St. Gabe's. And also um, another question that she asked was uh, whether or not there were offices for nurses. So there are office spaces. There's a number of them, an additional one we uh, you know, were able to acquire too. And how we divide those space, there will be space for uh, private space for counseling and for a nurse. Right now, we only have a nurse two hours per week. That's something we wanna improve upon. That's not acceptable. Uh, to have that small amount of time. So we're looking at increasing the opportunity and then providing space for uh, the nurse, for offices, and for um, the principal's office, general office. Those are things that are all in the works. Thank you. Next is Miriam Desim. Um Sometimes Miriam is under a different name. Does anyone remember what she signs up as? What her screen name is? I believe it's Lisa. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Iva. Miriam has three minutes as well. Uh, Miriam, okay. Oh, Hi, guys. How are you? Fine. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you. Um, I just want to first congratulate the two new board members and actually also want to congratulate all of the board, all of the um, candidates. They ran an excellent um, campaign and um, I know we formed quite a bond, so expecting to work with with all of them and for the two that are leaving thank you for your service um and of course hopefully you're not gonna stop um being involved having said that the number that sticks out the most to me guys is 92 percent black and hispanic julia spoke about the ipes and that's good too but 92 percent black and hispanic that is unacceptable that tells you that you have discrimination, de facto segregation. You cannot have a school that is 92% black and Hispanic. Something is wrong. We're talking about how intimate it is and we're talking about how we're getting, um, you know, tailored and one-on-one and, and, and -on -one kind of learning and instruction. Well, why is, if that's so good, then why is it 92% black and Hispanic? Why are the white folks not taking care of, not, not taking part in this? This is an, an unacceptable process. You then blamed Valerie for bringing up saying that she's not gonna vote for this and Julia bringing it up now. You are just telling them now, they just got to visit the place last night. You guys talked about you've been doing this for six months and you didn't have time to get the people involved. We've been asking for months. This is so unacceptable. You're not prepared. You don't even know that the gym is not going to be available. That is just an indication of how unprepared you are to make this happen. If this place is so bad that you've been there for I don't know how many years, 
then guess what? Bring them to the high school, take four or five classes in house four, make them take the lessons and learn there. That's what we need to do. Or keep them there and figure out how to make it more secure. But bringing them to Bethesda right now is absolutely wrong. And it's unacceptable to say that your deadline is June 30th. If you've been working this for six months, then you should have gotten us involved. That's not our problem. And that damn sure isn't Valerie's problem. So that, that is so wrong the way you answered Valerie. You were way off and you're delusional. So you've got to fix this. this. This is, again, you're making decisions and telling us, oh, let's go through with it. Let's figure it out later. You, you're talking about you're going to have a lab thing on a cart. I asked my son, what's in your lab class? He says, there's, there's microscopes. There's, there's um, chromatograph machines. There's, there's, there's Bunsen burners. You're going to have a lab science because you have a sink and because you're going to put it on a cart. How's that going to happen? You know your school is not going to be equal. This is this. We're bringing in people from mm -hmm. outside because this is unacceptable. Sorry, Miss Desim. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I can address the um, the lab. So, I'm I'm sorry, Carl's not here, but the lab was just a facility and wasn't working. Any of the equipment that's in the current lab the microscopes and some of those other things can come along, but the carts are designed for the course that you're teaching. So it's either going to be one course, uh, one cart for all of the courses, or we were talking to Director Schwach about having one for each class. It contains all the materials that you would need to be able to have it. It'll be, there'll be a sink, there'll be an eye wash, everything we need in the classroom, and the cart comes equipped with everything we need for the course. But uh, the, the equipment that we do have at campus uh, would come over with us as well. Okay. And I, I believe, uh, and I don't know if this is correct, but you had shared in November that there was no science lab at all at St. Gabe's, no cart, no nothing. I, there is no uh, lab. The, there is some equipment that they were using, but there's no lab classes. Um, what, what was shared in November in public was that Ms. Schwach brought to your attention that students were sitting for regions without doing labs. Without doing a lab class. Right. They were not, right. They did not have the weekly lab course that was required to seat for the regions. Right. And so there was, for previous years, no lab offered. So next is Ms. Tucker, um, who has two minutes. So I'm going to look for her. Oh, um, okay. I'm just letting you guys know that uh, the notification came on on my screen that says that Ms. Tucker has an older version of Zoom and the only way to allow her to speak is to allow her to become a panelist. So I, I will do that um, because we, I can remove her. So there's no reason, I, unless somebody opposes this, there's no reason to not let her become a panelist for a moment. Ms. Tucker? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, great, thanks. Um, Ms. Tucker, you, you have two minutes. Okay, I have been a teacher at the campus school for 29 years, and the first thing I want to address is the labs. What has been said about the science lab is untrue. So students have been taking labs, and no student has ever sat for regions without the proper number of, of science labs. As we were informed as a staff, uh, in February that we were moving to Bethesda and that was the end of the story. We were not asked for our input. We were not addressed by anybody. We were not addressed by any, any of the administration. Our, we know our students better than anyone. We know what they need. And I think it's offensive the way that you guys have been describing the campus school. It is not gloomy. It is not decrepit. You know, I don't oppose campus moving at all, but we need to move to a space that is a better, more modern, and well-maintained building. And I'm sorry, but Bethesda Baptist is not that building. Bethesda, the hallways are a labyrinth that's going to be hard to secure. The classrooms are far too small to fit the students' needs. The science lab that you guys are describing is a closet. You're not going to be able to comfortably fit all the students in there with a sink 
a cart and science equipment. You know, Dr. Marrero talked about being in a trailer. You are taking our students and sticking them in a trailer. This, the, the facility is totally unequal. If you care about students and the well-being of the ones that attend campus, then you, we, they need more support. And Bethesda is not that place. Thank you. So, so the lab classes uh, were not in the program. They were not scheduled and they were not, there was insufficient seat time to be able to sit That's for regents. We had to make it up That's this year. We, we went through the minutes and it was resolved. I had a long conversation with the guidance counselor about it and I'm sorry, but this information is it's inaccurate. It's inaccurate. Okay. I think, I don't think, I don't think this is productive. We, we definitely um, respect um, you for coming, Ms. Tucker, and for taking the time to visit Bethesda yesterday and for the years of commitment to campus school. Um, you know, your concerns are duly noted. And the, the issue about the seat time is it's separate and apart. And we can right. discuss no, it another right. day, but. You're right, but I'm concerned there's no bulletin boards. There's no blackboards. Some rooms have no windows and I don't see Bethesda as a bright, cheery place. When okay. I walked in, the first thing I saw I, was- I hate to do this. I hate to do this, Ms. Tucker, because it's, it seems extremely wrong because you're a teacher. Uh, you have two minutes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. But I, I really want you to know that we, we uh, appreciate your concerns and, um, and, and I believe that your question should be answered. It might be all the more reason why we should table it for a while before we vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next uh, for two minutes is Neil Schultz. I don't believe that he is with us any longer, but if he comes back, we'll certainly give him his time. Mr. Warhead, who's first on your list? Fran Lazzarini. Fran. Friend, yeah. yeah. She, she may have signed out, but uh, yeah. Or a note. Yeah. There was a note from her, I think. I can text her too. Um, but we'll just move on and I'll text her. She can come back on. Next is, uh, <laughs> next is Samira Rahman. S A M I R A is the first name. Okay. Okay. I don't see. I don't see her either. Okay. Next is uh, Morgan with two N's, Davis, D A V I S. And Samira, I'm getting a message that Samira is here, uh, but I don't know. Uh, what name is she under? Uh, I have it under Samira Rahman, R A H M A N. But is that the name that she's logged in on? Because there's no yeah, yes. such name. Okay. Right, I don't you. see that name you in don't the see list. It, then she's not there. Okay. Do any of my colleagues see her? I mean, to just check me. I, I don't see her. Hand is she says her hand is raised. She's at the very top, third from the top. Yeah, I see her. She's oh, okay, her. okay. She's out of sequence because her hand is raised. Yeah. I will certainly check from I'll certainly lesson learned. Two minutes. Welcome. Hi, so de facto segregation in our city is prominent and we can start addressing these issues at an early educational level, but first we need transparency and consistency from the board. The meeting for tonight's Zoom wasn't posted until after 6 p.m. and it hadn't been updated since the second of this week. And our initiative, New Rochelle Education Call to Action, was started on the 11th of this month. And on that day, 100, over 100 were sent to the Board of Education and other local officials. We called for the desegregation of our school district and supplemental reform programs to effectively bridge the opportunity gap we so clearly see between students of color and their white counterparts, most notably in the high school and our two middle schools. In that response from su the superintendent, she said that she would invite interested stakeholders to serve on a committee that would allegedly address and solve these longstanding oppressive issues. And then at one in the morning on the day of the meeting, she responded to my outreach coordinator, Nadia Smith, saying that the meeting had been canceled and this wasn't posted publicly to anyone. It wasn't on the website and it wasn't emailed back to the people that she had sent the initial response to. And then the meeting was adjourned to the 18th, again, with no notice. And there wasn't any public posting of the link. We were checking, me and my team were now almost 40 people. 
and neither of these two meetings included the discussion of the proposed committee on their agendas. Since then, the notice for the June 17th meeting is not on the website anymore. According to the open meetings law of section 104, the time and place of a meeting must be scheduled at least one week prior and shall be posted in one or more public locations at least 72 hours before such meeting. The meeting notice for tonight again was posted on the 22nd yesterday, according again to email correspondence between Feho and Nadia Smith. I request for my proposal to be added to the agenda for the next meeting and I kindly ask for your contribution and time. Thank you. Um, I, I I got, I saw, I was privy to some of the email exchanges between you and the superintendent. And one of the things that was, uh, I think, conf somehow was lost in the messaging that the district sent out, you're referencing a meeting on the 16th um, that in was email, scheduled for the, said the 17th. No, there was no meeting. There, so the, the, this, let me, I'm just gonna, I should be, very clear with you. For, first, I'm going to mute you because you're done now. But the the 16th, we had a board meeting scheduled, and that was canceled because of the canvas, the canvas of the vote, because the election was postponed, and the 16th was canceled and moved to today. the The meeting on the 17th was scheduled. It's a very short meeting. It's supposed to confirm the canvas, and it's called declare the canvas. It's a it's a process. It's a perform a thing that the board does. It's not a board meeting. So there, um, there's some level of confusion there. It was canceled because we did not have time to finish counting the, I don't know, 10,000 plus votes. And it was then scheduled for the 18th um, to do the declaration of the canvas. And um, in terms of what um, amounts of notices are required or whatever, I can turn that over to the clerk. But the the school board does everything it can uh, through the clerk who's um, incredibly committed and very knowledgeable to uh, post meetings in at the correct time uh, but we couldn't post the meeting for the 18th until it became clearer that we would be done counting the vote and the meeting on the 18th took place and uh, lasted i think i don't know maybe five minutes where we voted on two resolutions and we confirmed the new board members for the board and the two new trustees for the library. So I think that um, it would be lovely uh, for maybe you to reach out again. I'm happy to talk to you. I've spoken to you before. Um, so that I can at least go through some of the process with you. I, I don't disagree with some of the um, uh, things you're trying to do. But I, I do think that the, some of the details that you have are just, they're just not correct. Who's next? Uh, Morgan Davis. Okay. Okay. Two minutes. You're muted. Okay, perfect. Hi, I'm an alumni of the campus school at St. Gabriel's. All of the resources that were provided to me as a student there helped me to become a successful woman that I am today. I don't know what I would have done without that program. Moving the school removes from moving the school from the St. Gabriel's location to Bethesda, to Bethesda Church removes the detrimental tools needed for our students to be successful. 20 years, over 20 years of hard work and dedication from the staff at the campus school has helped students to feel apart, to not feel shortchanged or less than, and to reassure them that they're receiving the same education, the same quality of education as those at the high school. It is my hope that all of you would take a real good look at what's really important. Is aesthetics important or the substance that's inside of that building? Maybe St. Gabriel is an ugly sight for you, or as you said, gloomy and dark, but it offers something more rich, more important to our students. I, I take this opportunity now to beg you to really take in consideration of the children in New Rochelle School District. You all came here to help them, help them. One of the teachers at St. Gabriel's told me, when you look at a situation, don't look at the situation as the glass half full, but look at it, excuse me, half empty, but look at it as half full. 
Unfortunately, you've taken the glass away from students. They don't even have the opportunity to, to reach their highest potential in a building that doesn't have a, a science lab, that doesn't have a gymnasium, that doesn't have everything that all the other students in the district have. It's not fair. And really, please, just take your time and find a location that's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Rosa Rivera McCutcheon. Okay. Two minutes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> I think the conversation between the board members um, earlier today demonstrates once again that um, the big issue is, is not even whether or not St. Gabe's uh, is better or worse than Bethesda. The big issue is that the community, yet again, um, the students, the teachers, many of whom are community members, um, and the actual parents and families were not consulted. Um, this has been done seemingly uh, in the dark, um, which really in a lot of ways jettisoned a potentially useful opportunity to engage in conversations that are meaningful. Um, and instead, um, we've come to this point once again, um, where we recognize that the leadership uh, you know, failed us. Um, I do appreciate some of the board members today who did stand up um, and articulate this. As always, I appreciate um, Ms. Williams. I appreciate uh, Ms. Merchant. I appreciate uh, Ms. Muggle Oaks. I appreciate uh, Ms. Relkin. And, and unlike, um, uh, unlike was said, Ms. Relkin, I did not take your comment as a, a negative statement about Bethesda or about the community, but rather that it is not necessarily an appropriate space for the school. But that's really neither, neither here nor there. The issue is that the community was not engaged. The folks who do the work, the folks that are in the community, the folks that are, the kids that are in the school were not engaged. Um, and this is, this has been wholly problematic uh, and continues to be. Um, and I also take significant issue with Mr. Warhead's um, response to the community uh, comments. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. McCutcheon. Who's next? Adam Cooper. Okay. I think he was just under Adam. Yep. Oh, no, he has a full name now. I changed it so it'd be easier to find. My apologies that I threw you a curveball this evening. <laughs> Um, first and foremost, um, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Daniello and Ms. Merchant for their service as board members over these past years, um, recognizing the tremendous commitment and amount of time that this requires. Having sat as a PTA uh, executive officer, I can only imagine that it's tremendously more, and I want to say thank you for your service both to the district and the, to the community, um, and wanted to recognize that as we go forward. Um, speaking of people leaving, the retirements being done today, I was truly disappointed that this happened five days after school closed. And the fact that we are losing such tremendous teachers, these are teachers that have been in the district, not only for um, children who have gone through, but also children of parents who have gone through. And I would hope that the board would publish the list in its entirety, as well as continue to make available their email addresses to those individuals. Now that school has ended, the children won't have a chance to say goodbye properly. And I think that the board should consider leaving their email addresses intact so that they can continue to receive the well wishes of the students who were unable to say a proper goodbye. Uh, we took a tremendous survey on distance learning 2.0. Uh, you sent out a school-wide email. I would love to know if we're getting any of those results fed back. Um, I would also like to point out that one of the biggest shortcomings of distance learning was the multiple applications. Um, there were 12 that Dr. Marrero showed on his slide today just for the summer school. That's not counting Google or Zoom, which are integral. Parents had to look in no less than four different places in any one single application to find out what assignments had been given to our children and what was due and when. I got to say, 
we need technology to be elevated to an assistant superintendent level so that this yet again gets the focus that it needs. Um, I'm running out of time desperately, but I will talk quickly about this schedule because it concerns me tremendously in this time of crisis that the Board of Ed is not living up to its bylaws and that having only a single meeting between the July 7th organizational meeting and the September 8th meeting is kind of crazy during this time of crisis and the fact that we need to be focusing on COVID-19 and preparedness Thank as you. we go forward. Thank you. Um, two things. So first we have um, uh, individual, we had little conversations on the board about uh, the likely need that we were gonna have to add uh, more meetings than usual because of all of the reasons that Mr. Cooper stated. So that's not in the official calendar. And um, although that might have been nor fine under different circumstances, it, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we're gonna have more meetings. Um, also, I was uh, uh, notified by, by um, Ms. McCutcheon that when I was removing people from speaking, it was kicking them out of the meeting, which is absolutely not my intention. So um, there's an option to remove um, and there's an option to disable. And I was pushing remove and that was totally inadvertent. And I apologize to anyone I did that to. And I, it will not, you know, I hope it doesn't happen again. Absolutely not on purpose. Um, I was just picking that option as a way to remove you from speaking, not remove you from the meeting. Um, and so I own that and I apologize. Who's next? Nora Lamoran. Okay. Okay, I see her. Hi, Nora. Two minutes. Oh, you're muted, Ms. Lamoran. Can you hear me? Yes. There we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to first say, Mr. Warhit, your disdain for the community is well noted and reciprocated. Um, this is just another example of why um, Superintendent Fehu is not the right person for this job. Uh, the way this is being handled is on, on, the, on the trail of, of the uproar in our community for not being involved and not being uh, respected. This, this is a, a real spit in the face. Um, you know, you, you talk about one of the things that you mentioned is the percentage of kids in the school who have IPAs. Anyone who knows those kids to say that they can walk to New Rochelle High School and back, you know, I, I listen, I have a sister who's one of those kids. She couldn't make it to the, the bathroom and back without guidance. She got distracted. Um, and to say that they can be in a room with, with I'm, I know Bethesda well, a room that's separated by a partition where you hear what's going on on the other side, that's a nightmare. And uh, um, the, the, the racial makeup of that school has always been an issue. And to place it in the Lincoln Avenue corridor and act like that's an answer is like having a, a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth. Um, the, the contribution by that teacher was really important and by the students and that they were not given more time is a sin. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just wanna, I have a couple seconds left. I just wanna say, imagine you trying to move part of the Ward or Davis community, not talking to anyone and then saying, you know, accept it. Dr. Fehu, you went once to the campus school and made a decision and ran with it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just clarify that I've been to campus school multiple times? That is uh, absolutely inaccurate that I've been there once. I was there from the beginning weeks uh, straight through uh, a number of times. Okay. Um, who's next? Emile Denaye. D apostrophe N I A Y E. And what's For, the first? What's the Camille, first? C A M I L L E. Yes. Two minutes. Um, that's Camille N D I. The N is before the D, not after it. Um, I am similarly, as a lot of people mentioned, specifically Ms. Herbert, very troubled by the way 
that a school that has 92% black and brown children is being placed literally across the street of the site of the Lincoln School that per the Taylor case in 1951 was shut down due to de facto segregation in New Rochelle, that the district has done little if not anything to address. Our neighborhood school system has perpetuated this de facto segregation and opportunity gap in so many different places. You look at the statistics of our elementary schools, with Columbus being close to 90, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it is um, 82% Hispanic and 91% of color. There are clear systemat systemic issues in our district that we are not addressing. And this is just another example of um, an opportunity that the, the Board of Ed has to address this and isn't taking the time, the care, the community input um, to, to do what is right by a community that prides itself on diversity. That, that's what we put out there in the world that we are Nurshell, we're the, the epitome of diversity and to, to not live up to that for the sake of our students is, is kind of disgraceful. Um, I, I would encourage the board to consider looking through the Princeton plan that would um, move from a model of neighborhood schools to housing single to double two grades in one building and hopefully closing some of that opportunity gap. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Vaughn Parham, P-A-R-H-A-M. First name Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-N. I don't, I don't see him. We'll welcome him if he comes back. Okay. Uh, let me check the top of the list just in case he has his sure. hand up. That's something I just learned. No. Who's next? Uh, Margaret Bavosa. Okay. Yes, I see her. Welcome. Two minutes. Oh, you're muted. Mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Margaret Bavosa. I'm a recently retired teacher from Albert Leonard Middle School, and I'm a long-term sub for the district. I'm a parent, grandparent of seven children who formerly or presently attend six of our schools and a taxpayer. After numerous calls each day last week to the superintendent's office, my only response from her to my request for a response by phone came from her secretary, graciously, and the middle school principal. My feeling, I did not rate a personal response. As other people spoke, disrespect and dismissiveness is key to whatever's going on there. In light of the negative publicity regarding racist posts by middle school students recently, the district missed a golden opportunity to celebrate our eighth graders in a public and positive fashion for graduation. A drive-through where student names were not announced at one middle school, celebratory banners and balloons were not visibly displayed along the route, and music that was not celebratory in nature left eighth graders, especially those who might be average or struggling students, feeling like stepchildren. Equity, certainly the students did not get anything like the fifth grade students or the kindergarten and pre-K students in different schools in our district. How hard would it have been to have a drive-through at Five Islands Park using the pavilion or gazebo? I had offered to call the state. I would have done anything. Perhaps with several months to think about it, there might be a time to celebrate these children as ninth graders in the high school to realize that they are not secondary citizens. You need to involve the students to become more academically successful. You say you want to be inclusive. You want to improve grades and academic benefits for children based on socioeconomic, racial, and other considerations. If you're interested, I have a number of suggestions for that. I won't hold my breath, though, to see if I receive a phone call back from Dr. Fehu, as that is probably not going to happen. I am very visible and very positive 99% of the time. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you. Who's, who's next? Kenya Bynum, B Y N. That's alphabetical by first name. So, what's the first name? K. Kenya, K E N Y A. Thank you. Okay, there's, there's 
there's there's a Kenya one. So I will I will invite her in. And there's no last name attributed, so I hope it's the right person. Yes, that's me. Okay, welcome. Two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for taking time to gather information and present all of your data in regard to the campus school move. I am a Nourishell resident, educator, and black female born and raised in this city. It is extremely off-putting that we would consider placing our campus students in our Lincoln School corridor, primarily because of the history of de desegregation in the exact area. Members of my family have authentically experienced the desegregation period of time in our city. For individuals of a certain age whom are lifelong residents, this is a very touchy subject. I believe we are going backwards with placing our 92% Black and Hispanic students back in this area exclusively. It is educationally unsound to provide substantially less to a population that needs more. The Bethesda space has even less space than the current one. I see a lot of key stakeholders here in this meeting. You mentioned that you worked on this for six months and it was never mentioned to the community. Have you consulted with the Director of Security, Bruce Daniele, in regards to the security and safety of this transition? I'm wondering why he wasn't included in this meeting. I'm also imagining the possible increased level of stress for campus students without adequate gym facilities and them possibly traveling to the high school during their lunch hour. Have you taken into consideration that some students don't want to be at the high school and that's why they elected to go to the campus school in the first place? This new ranch with golden doors may sound good to some of you, but we need to be honest, this was a decision made in a bubble. The staff, students, and community were not involved. This was not a collaborative effort and transparency was lacking here. Campus students matter. Thank you. Who's next? Brenda DiGiacomo. Brenda, the Giacomo? Yep. There's a Brenda, so I'll invite her, but I don't know if it's the right person. Welcome. Brenda, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, two minutes. Okay, so uh, I love St. Gabe's and uh, my son was a part of the program. They always told us about other classes that were not offered at the St. Gabe's that were offered at the high school for him. Um, he did do labs. The only thing I did not like was the nurse that was not there all the time. And that was for the medical reasons um, that it happened, but that's a different issue. Um, but also I wanna know is if we do do the church, but I'm not agreeing to, but if we do, is it the same thing like you had Wexford at the church where they'd be sharing rooms and having classes? And over the years, I've been saying, also over the years, I've been saying there's been issues at Columbus, even though I had five kids who graduated there. So there needs to be looked at Columbus because it's not diverse as it should be. Also, there are bullying going on at Isaac, and that was not also addressed. And my daughter was one of them. And a video went around that was created of fights and everything, and there was nothing done about it. And I'm also not happy with the graduation that the eighth graders had because my twins graduate. But I want to thank the board and the teacher for everything that you have done this year because it's been hard. Thank you to the two that are retiring um, from the board. And I want to thank all the teachers because a lot of you touched my heart and my kids' heart. And I wish you a happy next journey on your life, what you choose to do. And my heart goes out to all the families who lost the love with love on this year. And thank you for your time and your patience and have a good night. Thank you so much. Who's next? Timothy McKnight. Hmm. And when does he go by any other name? Because he's not on the list. Nope. Timothy McKnight. Okay. Who's next? Uh, Sharon Foots. I saw her. Yep. Hi, Ms. Foots. You're muted, though. Am I? You're good now. Yep. You're good now. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I kind of, I'm going to try to be really quick. Um, I just want to bring up the constant of the board saying we're going to be transparent, we're going to be inclusive. I could look at this for the last five meetings. You have said the same thing to the community over and over. 
and every month you guys have failed to do so. Um, I want to bring up the fact that there's 30% uh, of the students at um, St. Gabriel's have IEPs and you only offer one special education teacher. That bothers me. Um, St. Gabriel's to me is, is starting to look like um, a Willowbrook. Willowbrook in the sense of a certain population being housed in one building and not offering adequate services. Um, and that is what I believe that you are doing um, wh wherever St. Gabriel, wherever the alternative school is. But I want to be very clear. I, and I know that I live the closest to any of you on the board in this community. And I am telling you that I believe that St. Gabriel's, I mean, the, the alternative school should not be at Bethesda Baptist Church. There are other options. The Masons purchase the um, College of New Rochelle. The fact of the matter that you, none of you decided that it was important enough to look into multiple locations is disturbing. I don't know if Rachel said it or Julia said it, but when I purchase, uh, when I'm looking for a home, a car, I, I, I look at more than one option, right? I would never just say, oh, I'm gonna get the first car that I see. I absolutely would not. And that is exactly what you all did by making this decision. And don't get me wrong, Bethesda is, has a beautiful, and let's call it what it is. It is a catering hall. It has a beautiful catering hall. It is, if, if, when, if I went there, I, I would recognize the beauty in it. But the beauty in it as a catering hall is not the same thing that lends to it being adequate for um a place of education. I would also like to bring up, there were mm -hmm. some things that- Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Foots, because I'm not um, watching the time. I was just listening to you and I, I missed that your time uh, lapsed. Okay. But I would like to let you finish your sentence. Okay, I just want to point out, I'm sorry, because I couldn't see the time either. Yeah, I, um, I just, I just want to point out that there are several construction projects going on over this three year period in that immediate area. And I too also do not think that that is fair to the students to have to walk through or be around a construction site. All right, thank you. Thank you. Timothy McKnight uh, is available. Okay, good. Um, yes, I see him. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I just have, I have a question, then I have a statement. So my question would be, um, for someone who went to St. Gabe's, how, was Mr. Fritterich, I know he's retired, but what, did you guys consult or bring Mr. Friedrich in or Mr. Matera or um, any of those teachers that have been involved in the school for all these years is my question. And then my statement would be, um, I heard a lot. Um, what was disturbing to me was um, from the director now who said that, you know, one of the things that bothered her in St. Gabe's was the, the lights not being bright. First of all, someone that attended St. Gabe's, St. Gabe's saved our lives and saved a bunch of our lives. And, and I think that it's sad that we talk about, we're talking about a lot of stuff, but we're not talking about what the kids feel. We feel like that's home for us. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a um, member of Bethesda and I have nothing against Bethesda. And I feel like it's sad that we're using Bethesda and a lot of people are going against what's going on um, because of everything that's happening. And it's sad as a resident, I feel like we're feeling, the school board is feeling us once again. And, you know, you guys need to, it, it need to stop being, oh, you know, it's what it is now. No, this is not fair. It's not fair to our community. A lot of stuff is going on and this is really upsetting to me because I attended St. Gabe's once again, like I said, and this is not servicing the kids that's, that's attended St. Gabe's. It's saving our kids' lives. That school saves our kids' lives. That school might be more important than anything in the school to the kids that, that, that really need that school. So I really want y'all to think about board members. I heard a lot of stuff in agreeance with everything else. I hear a lot of members saying things, but really think about the kids that that school service. It serves kids that need that school and those teachers that really care for their school. So I really want y'all to really think about the decisions y'all making when y'all make these and the hurt that y'all have given to these families and these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Oh, can, I, can I address one part of that? I just, I don't know There's if we made it exceptionally clear all of the teachers and staff and the, the safety and everyone involved at the uh, St. Gabe's will be going to the new location. So a lot of this is about the people that are there. And I mentioned who I spoke with and who I may not have spoken with, but all of the caring people that are at one site are coming over to the other site. So I at least wanted to just make sure that that was clear. Who's next? That's it. All right. 
think that gives us a lot to think about. Can I get a motion and a second to table resolution 20-428 authorizing the lease agreement with Bethesda for, I'll pick a date, um, try and give us the most amount of time. Let's make it, um, let's make it, let's make it Friday the 26th in case if, if it go, if it's, if we move forward with it, we would give the administration the 29th and the 30th to do whatever they want. Can we table it to the 26th? Can I get a motion to table it till the 26th? So moved. Uh, uh, can I have a, ask a question? Um, will we be able to discuss it? Yeah, oh yeah. Before any vote, like let's say we table it to the 26th, for example. Okay then what would happen would be it would be a resolution on the agenda it might be a standalone resolution or the superintendent might choose to uh, make it a special meeting add a couple of others but before any resolution um you always have an opportunity to discuss so i would say is there a motion well on this one in particular i would obviously say on purpose motion they would be seconded and i would say discussion um so what all we're doing right now is we're saying let's not talk about it now let's not vote it on it now let's move it to the 26th which is friday and we'll um, pick it up then and, and discuss it. And maybe the superintendent has more information, less information. Maybe we'll get more community involvement, less community involvement. I'm not sure what it will look okay. like. Okay. I don't think I can do Friday. So um, I, I don't think I'll be able to participate Friday evening. Okay, so then can we have a motion and a second to move it to the 27th, Saturday? So moved, Dianuzi. All right, motion seconded for the last time, Daniela. Okay, all in favor for Saturday, we'll find an appropriate time on Saturday. Okay. All right. Okay, Saturday. Aye. Uh, opposed? Opposed to the 27th. Okay, good. Motion carries the table to the 27th. I'll work with the clerk to find an, you know, survey the board and find an appropriate time to schedule a meeting for that resolution.